Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. I want to start by pointing out the reason these films are being produced. It is not because I have any particular interest in personal tragedy type stories and all the emotions that go with them. It is because this case demonstrates how establishment organisations such as TV and media including the BBC, the government, the Prime Minister, the Cabinet Office and government agencies, British Intelligence and Scotland Yard are used nefariously for a range of purposes that most people are not aware of. It is the cancer within and the blatant corruption at play in these organisations that I am exposing in these films. It is my belief that these elements of the establishment are in criminal hands and the sooner this is exposed to a wider audience the better. In this film I intend to put under the microscope one of the most important aspects of the Madeleine McCann case and that is the question of what hard evidence there actually is of an abduction or more particularly what evidence we have that there was an abductor. There has been a bewildering variety of suspects, persons of interest and people we want to eliminate from our inquiries paraded before us over the years by various police forces and the McCann's own private investigators. Here is a collection of just 14 of them which the Daily Telegraph put together in 2009. In my previous documentaries I have looked in some detail at the McCann's account of what they said they saw and did after discovering they say Madeline's empty bed. I examined the contradictions, the changes of story and the physical evidence of what the police found or didn't find in the McCann's apartment. I quoted from the interim police report of Inspector Tavares de Almeida which he signed off on the 10th of September 2007 just a day after the McCann's returned to England having been made suspects in Madeline's disappearance. Speaking of the McCann's apartment, the inspector wrote, for example, there is strong evidence that the crime scene was altered and furniture was moved around. Those changes are indications that the abduction was a stage-managed hoax. As time went by, the abduction scenario was not confirmed. The abduction hypothesis did not stand up. His overall conclusions were devastating. Madeleine McCann died in apartment 5A at the Ocean Club Resort in Praia de Luz. A staged hoax of an abduction took place. The McCanns concocted the claim that the apartment was regularly checked while they slept. The McCanns concealed their daughter's corpse. From what has been established up to now, everything indicates that the McCanns, in self-defense, did not want to deliver up Madeleine's corpse. There is therefore a strong possibility that it was moved from the initial place where she died. We know from the Portuguese police reports, which were publicly disclosed on DVDs in July 2008, that there was no physical evidence of an abductor. No fingerprints, no DNA, nothing in the apartment that suggested an intruder. We saw in my previous film how the McCanns spoke to friends and family who then told the media that someone had jemmied open the shutters and broken them. This was then proven to be false within the first 24 hours. The McCanns later made the claim that the abductor, as he removed Madeline from the apartment, may have opened the curtains, window and shutter as a red herring. In order to sustain a claim that Madeline was abducted, evidence of an abductor is required. The McCanns got it from one of their close friends who was on holiday with them, Jane Tanner. She said she had seen an abductor the evening Madeline disappeared at about 9.15pm. And five and a half months later, the McCann team produced this image of him. What I intend to show in my film is that this so-called abductor, said to have been seen by Jane, was most likely bogus, a phantom. 
I will also reveal startling evidence about how her description appears to have been originated by examining the claims of a German resident, Nuno Lorenco de Jesus, who was on holiday with his Portuguese mother in Sagres, about 15 miles from Praia de Luz, where the McCanns were on holiday. He claims that days before Madeline was reported missing, he saw a man photographing children on Sagres Beach, who later tried to kidnap his daughter. I will call this man Sagres Man, and in a moment I will name him. Finally in my film, I will deal with the claims made on BBC's Crime Watch programme in 2013 by a former head of Scotland Yard's Madeline McCann investigation, Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood, that he had now, after six years, found the man allegedly seen by Jane Tanner. He said it was a man who had been carrying his young daughter home from a night crash that evening. On top of that, DCI Redwood resurrected on Crime Watch a claimed sighting of an abducted by an Irish family, the Smiths, from Drogheda, claiming that this man was now the central focus of his investigation. I will examine Scotland Yard's claims in great detail. To be clear, what we have is four separate claims of an abductor. These I shall call Sagres Man, allegedly tried to kidnap a young girl from her parents on the Sunday before Madeline was reported missing. Tanner Man, a man carrying a young child allegedly seen by the McCann's friend Jane Tanner. Smith Man, a man carrying a young child allegedly seen by members of an Irish family. And finally, Crash Man, the man Scotland Yard say was the man really seen by Jane Tanner. Jane Tanner's description of a man carrying a child was the first in time to be reported. The police were told about it soon after they arrived, late in the evening on the 3rd of May 2007, the day Madeline was reported missing. Her sighting was reported to Jerry McCann and the other members of their group, known as the Tapas Seven, on two timelines scribbled down by Jane Tanner's partner, Dr. Russell O'Brien. They were written down on the ripped-off cover of Madeline's Sainsbury's Activity sticker book. These scribblings were allegedly done in a hurry that evening, or possibly before that evening. We don't know who ripped off the cover of Madeline's book, as no one has told us. Most likely, either Madeline's mother or father, Jerry or Kate McCann. A staggering five and a half months later, a sketch of this man was finally produced by a lady called Melissa Little, who the public were told was an FBI-trained forensic artist. If we look at the two timelines, we see on the first one the entry 920-5 stroke Ella crossed out, Jane checked 5D, sees stranger and child. 5D is the apartment of Russell and Jane. Then on the second line, this is changed slightly to 9.20pm, Jane Tanner sees stranger walking carrying a child. Later, the McCanns and Jane Tanner pinpointed the time of this alleged sighting to 9.15pm rather than 9.20pm. Jane Tanner told police in her first statement, dated the 4th of May 2007, that as she walked up the lane towards her holiday apartment and the McCann's holiday apartment, she saw a man carrying a child with a hurried walk, it being this detail together with the fact that the child was dressed in pyjamas without being wrapped in a blanket that caught her attention. She only managed to see him from the side with the child in his arms. She noticed the individual's presence exactly when she had just passed Jerry and Jez who were talking. I think you were standing like that and, Joe, and Jez was there with his pram pointing down that way. Because I think if you'd have been looking at me, because I, I would have said something, because I would have said about, because Kate had been moaning that you'd been gone a long time watching the football. I'm almost certain that when I came out, I came <laughs> over and he was here and I was like that. That's my memory of it, is like, Jez is 6'3 or something and looking up and then turning in when I finish. Mm. That's my memory of yeah. it. By 9.15pm it was already dark. There was limited street lighting in the area. According to Jane Tanner's own evidence, she saw the man with child crossing the lane ahead of her and could only have seen him sideways on for a maximum of four to five seconds. Yet. Asked to describe the man she saw, she was able to give all the following details to the Portuguese police the next day. Dark-skinned individual, male sex, aged between 35 to 40, slim physical appearance, about 1.7 metres, 5 foot 7 tall, very dark, thick hair, longer at the back, she could only see him from behind. He was wearing linen-type cloth trousers, beige to golden in colour, wearing a dark duffy-type jacket, but not that thick. His shoes were dark in colour, classic type, he had a hurried walk, 
he was carrying a child who was lying on both his arms in front of his chest. By the way he was dressed, he gave her the impression that he was not a tourist because he was very warmly dressed. Asked to describe the child, she said this. About the child whom appeared to be sleeping, she only saw her legs. The child appeared to be older than a baby. She was barefoot and was wearing what appeared to be cotton pyjamas of a light colour, possibly white or light pink. She is not certain, but has the impression a design on the pyjamas, possibly a floral pattern, but she's not certain. Her statement adds, as regard these details, she does not know what Madeline was wearing at the moment of her disappearance, because she did not talk to anyone about this. As to her concerns about the man she saw, she only spoke to Jerry about this, not entering into details, and to the police. Pausing there, how credible is it that her sighting appears on two timelines of the evening's events, written out that very evening by Russell O'Brien, yet she claims not to have informed anyone in the group except Jerry McCann, and then later the police. Jane Tanner was later to explain that she hadn't told Kate McCann about her sighting because, since Madeline was already missing, she didn't want to upset her any further. Again, how credible is that? Let's just recap. She says she saw someone carrying a child. When the McCanns reported Madeline missing, Jane Tanner told Jerry McCann about the sighting. Russell O'Brien wrote it down on the two timeline sheets on Madeline's sticker book. It must be perfectly obvious that a group of people worried sick about a missing child, one of whom had allegedly seen a man carrying a young girl clad only in pyjamas, would immediately have got together with Jane and fired question after question at her, such as, how old was the child? What was she wearing? What was the man wearing? What did he look like? Which way was he heading? Was anyone with him? Yet, according to the McCanns and Jane, this never happened. You would also expect the rest of the group to ask Jerry, Kate, what was Madeline wearing when she was taken? Yet, in Jane's statement, as we've just seen, she said, She, Jane, does not know what Madeline was wearing at the moment of her disappearance, because she did not talk to anyone about this but she does admit that she spoke to Jerry about her sighting. Again, how credible is it that Jerry didn't ask her exactly what the child was wearing, or that Jane didn't tell him everything that she claimed to have seen? A search for Madeline had begun sometime after half past ten, when the McCanns first reported Madeline's disappearance to the management of the Ocean Club and to the police. Villagers turned out to look for her. Some of them were searching all night. None of them seemed to have been aware that there had been a report by Jane of a man with a child walking away from near the McCann's apartment in a southeasterly direction, as she claimed. Had that information been given out, it might have helped the searchers to narrow the field of search. Six days later, on the 10th of May, Jane Tanner made a further statement to the police. In part of her statement, she elaborated further on her claimed sighting as follows. She can only affirm that the man that she saw carrying the child was in her belief associated with the disappearance of Madeline Beth McCann. Confronted with the information that the tracker dog teams had followed the scent trails in which, purportedly, Madeline Beth McCann had not passed the intersection where she indicated a man carried a child, she affirmed immediately that she was not lying, maintaining the honesty of her initial version that indeed there had passed in front of her a man carrying in his arms a barefoot child. At the time she had not paid him much attention, because it is common at the Ocean Club for children to pass in the arms of their parents between the creche and their respective homes, when they have collected them from babysitting service. Only it was strange that the child had no cover blanket, and the way the man walked rapidly, and how he was dressed. The trousers were slightly wide, their entire length being straight. They, the trousers, were as to colour identical to quartzite, a type of floor covering, chino style. As for the coat, it was dark coloured, seeming to be the same material as the trousers, it being a type of anorak. As for the footwear, she relates that she cannot confirm with certainty, but there were shoes which enabled the man to be fleet-footed. OK. So let's now look at how Jane Tanner has suddenly elaborated on her initial description of the man, adding all these extra details. The colour of his trousers was the same as quartzite. The style of his trousers was chino style. His coat was dark. His coat appeared to be of the same material as his trousers. The coat was a type of anorak. The shoes were of a type that enabled the man to be fleet-footed, whatever that means. How could she now remember these additional details? 
Could she really have deduced, only seeing the man for seconds, that his jacket or anorak was made out of the same material, that the trousers were chino style and the colour of cortisite? Remember, she only saw this man for five seconds at the most. And what is meant by shoes of a type that enabled the man to be fleet-footed? We now know that the Portuguese police were uncertain about Jane Tanner's evidence from day one, and that's why the public never knew about it for over three weeks. If we refer back for a moment to the extensive report of Inspector de Almeida, we can soon see why. Here are some extracts from his report. The child's parents immediately attributed her disappearance to the action of a third party, promoting the scenario that she had been abducted. The family publicised their claim that Madeleine had been abducted in a manner that had never been seen before. The very next day, British television stations led their broadcasts with the news of Madeleine's disappearance. The media presented the abduction as truth, although we were looking at other scenarios. As time went by, the abduction scenario was not confirmed. For instance, no ransom was ever demanded in exchange for information by the alleged kidnappers or for the child herself. Still, considering the evidence of Jane Tanner, we continued examining the possibility that Madeline had been abducted. She said she saw someone crossing the street in front of her. This information occupied us for a long time. This may be an example of how information that is not correct may not only delay the investigation, but could even have led to losing the little girl. Jane Tanner insisted her account was true, but there was a discrepancy about the moment Jane Tanner allegedly saw an abductor between the statements of Dr. Gerald McCann and Jane Tanner. They claimed to have passed each other only feet away, yet failed to see each other. Even the exact location where they supposedly crossed each other's paths is not very well defined by either. Also, the precise moment when Jane Tanner chose to make her statement about what she had seen and her explanation for choosing that moment is unreal. It is not easy to accept that any witness from the group on seeing someone with a child in their arms walking away from the McCann's apartment didn't act and speak immediately. Then there is her description of the abductor being altered or perfected. These reasons mean there is little credibility in what she says. Furthermore, Jane Tanner says that when she saw the man with the child, another man, Jeremy Wilkins, was talking to Jerry, but Wilkins doesn't remember seeing her either. Moreover, Jane says that she was on one side of the street, but Jerry says they were on the other. Yet another indication that Jane Tanner's story may have been a fabrication comes from Kate and Jerry McCann themselves. Jane Tanner says that when she saw the man carrying a child, she was about five metres away from him. But the same day Jane was saying that, the 4th of May, the McCanns were saying something very different. Kate McCann told the police, Jane, when she went to her apartment to see the children at around 9.15pm, saw from the back about 50 metres away on the perimeter road of the club a long-haired person in what she thinks were jeans with a child in his arms and walking very quickly but she is better able to tell you about that herself Jerry McCann said the same one of our group Jane at about 9.10 to 9.15 p.m. when she was going to her apartment to check on her children saw from the back about 50 metres away on the perimeter road bordering the club an individual carrying a child wearing pyjamas Jane will be able to clarify the situation. It looks as though someone had forgotten the script. Jane said 5 metres. The McCanns said 50. That's quite a difference. Also, if you look at the McCanns' two statements, notice the remarkable similarity in their wording. Jane went to her apartment, saw the man from the back, 50 metres, perimeter road, carrying a child, child wearing pyjamas. Jane can tell you more. So could this suggest people trying to remember a script? In October 2014, I managed to meet with a senior former member of the McCann's own UK-based Find Madeline investigation team. Now, very recently, somebody called Brenda Leyland, who had allegedly been sending messages on the internet about her opinions of the McCann's, um, was doorstepped by a Sky journalist and she then fled her home 
and then went to stay in a hotel and she was found shortly after that uh, dead. Now, I'm not sure what the cause of her death was. It said in the media that the death was not suspicious. How can it not be suspicious if she's fled her home under stress and then suddenly she's, she's found dead the following day? Now, the person that mainstream media should have doorstepped, I have come to try and speak to today. That is somebody called and I'm sitting outside the block of flats where he lives. Worked for the McCanns for six months, and in that six months, he had uh, an insight into the true investigation, quotes, investigation, uh, into allegedly trying to find Madeline. This man, who worked for the McCanns for six months, told me that he forensically examined all of Jane Tanner's statements as we have just done and he thought that none of what she said could have happened. The first the public knew anything about this sighting was on Saturday the 26th of May, over three weeks after Madeline was reported missing, when Jerry McCann summoned the world's media to a press conference. I could not find a video clip of this announcement online anywhere, so I will quote it for you. Jerry McCann stated, Good afternoon. We very much welcome the decision of the Portuguese authorities to release details of a man seen by a witness here in Praia de Luz on Thursday the 3rd of May, the night of Madeleine's disappearance. The release of this important information followed an earlier meeting that we had with senior Portuguese police officers, a meeting that Kate and I both found to be amicable and very constructive. We feel sure that this sighting of a man with what appeared to be a child in his arms is both significant and relevant to Madeline's abduction and we would appeal once again to anyone who may have seen him or anything else suspicious on or around the 3rd of May to come forward and tell the police. For instance, was this man seen anywhere else in or near the town with a child or what appeared to be a child? Which direction was he heading in? Did he have a vehicle? Whether you're a local resident or a holidaymaker who has since returned home from Portugal, any information, no matter how unimportant you may think it could be, may be vital in helping the Portuguese and British police to find our daughter. As we said yesterday, we wish for nothing more than to bring Madeline home with us safe and well. Kate and I would also like to make it clear that as this is very much an ongoing police investigation, we will not be making any further public statements for the time being. Thank you. The Portuguese police had by then already, at least in private, decided that Jane Tanner's so-called sighting was a fabrication. That is why they didn't want to release this description. There were several things, however, that the wider public did not know about this announcement. Firstly, it may well have been given out as the result of intervention by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown. Three days later, on the 29th of May, the Telegraph reported that the police only released details of a possible suspect sighting in the Madeleine McCann abduction inquiry after her parents talked to Gordon Brown. While the Times added this, a spokesman for the McCann family confirmed that Gordon Brown had telephoned the McCanns, though the spokesman stated that the details of the conversation would remain private. He did confirm that during the conversations Mr Brown offered both Jerry and Kate his full support in their efforts to find Madeleine. Second, the public had no idea that it was a close, long-term friend of the McCanns, one of the Tapper Seven, who had come up with the description. Third, the public had no idea that Jane Tanner had already told Portuguese police after an informal identity parade on the 13th of May, ten days after her alleged sighting, that she was sure that the person she claimed to have seen was in fact Robert Murat. Indeed, her positive identification of Murat triggered his being pulled in for questioning on the 15th of May and made a suspect. So the police already had a suspect based on Jane Tanner's story. Fourth, the public had no idea that every time Jane Tanner had been questioned by police, she added new details to her sighting, thus defying the well-known principle that memory fades with time. Jane Tanner's description of the man was released the same day by the Portuguese police. Notice that in Jerry's address to the world's media, he just refers to a man with what appeared to be a child in his arms, without referring to Tanner's evolving descriptions. Let's just look briefly now at the window of time given by the McCanns and their friends about when the abduction happened. Both Jerry McCann and Jane Tanner had been precise about their timings. 
Jerry said he left the apartment at 10 past 9. Jane says she saw him, Tanaman, at 9.15 p.m. This left a window of less than five minutes during which the abductor would have had to accomplish the following. Pick an opportunity to enter the apartment immediately after he had seen Jerry McCann leave the apartment at 10 past 9. Walk through the open patio door without being seen. Find Madeline in the dark. Pick her up without waking her or the twins, without leaving any forensic trace on the bed or anywhere else. Open the window without leaving any fingerprints. Open the shutters from the inside with nobody hearing him do so and once again without leaving any fingerprints. Leave the apartment without being seen by anyone except allegedly for a few fleeting seconds by Jane Tanner at around 9.15pm. In addition to all this, the McCanns on many occasions raised the possibility that whilst he was in the children's bedroom, he also stopped to sedate all three children. It wasn't until the 25th of October 2007 that the McCann team got round to issuing a sketch of Jane Tanner's alleged abductor. That was a total of 25 weeks after Madeline had been reported missing. It was of a faceless man seen from the side. And of course, this man has never been found. Unless, that is, you believe what DCI Andy Redwood of Scotland Yard told 6.7 million viewers on BBC Crime Watch on the 14th of October 2013. I will come to that very important subject later on. But for now, with that background about Jane Tanner's claimed sighting out of the way, I can now consider another claimed sighting that week which was to assume major importance on the second day of the official police investigation. This was a sighting of a man I am calling Sagres Man. There is quite a bit about Sagres Man in Dr. Gonchalo Amaral's book, The Truth of the Lie. This sighting made a deep impression on him, as we'll see in a moment. Sagres, by the way, is a small coastal village about 15 miles west of Praia de Luz, where the McCanns were staying. It is on the extreme southwestern tip of Europe, exposed to strong winds much of the time. Its small beach would be very unlikely to have many holiday makers on it in April. So let's start with what Dr. Amaral says in his book about the Sagres incident. Information from Sagres tells us that an individual was caught in the act of taking photos of several children on the Moretta beach and in particular of a little girl aged four, blonde with blue eyes, who looks like Madeline. It was the little girl's father who noticed him. This 40-year-old man wearing glasses tells the investigators that the photographer tried to kidnap his daughter in the afternoon on April the 26th in Sagres. He allegedly then fled in a hired car with a woman in the passenger seat. The stranger did not look like a tourist. Brown hair down to his collar, wearing cream-coloured trousers and jacket, and shoes of classic style. This report reminds us of the individual encountered by Jane Tanner in the streets of Villa de Luz on the evening of Madeline's disappearance. We circulate a photo, which we obtained thanks to a surveillance camera in a Lisbon shopping mall amongst holidaymakers, clients and employees of Praia de Luz restaurants. Fruitlessly, nobody saw them. On the other hand, employees of the restaurant they usually went to in the Burgau Budens area remember them. Fortunately, no one else has yet occupied the apartment the couple stayed in. It's low season. We go ahead with a thorough search, looking for evidence of a child's presence. Shoe prints, fingerprints or footprints, nothing. We then gather various hair samples, doubtless coming from adults, and notice drops of blood on a kitchen unit. Nothing conclusive, it's probably from an everyday domestic accident. First, I note that Gonchalo Amaral gives a very specific date of this incident, Thursday the 26th of April. That's very strange, because as we shall see in a moment, the witness to this alleged child snatching, Nuno Manuel Lorenco de Jesus, I'll refer to him as just Nuno Lorenco, states in his evidence specifically that the alleged incident happened on Sunday the 29th of April. There is no obvious explanation for this discrepancy of three days. Amaral's book places the incident on Thursday. Nuno Lorenco says Sunday. I refer to this as the alleged incident because, as we shall see in a moment, there are real doubts about whether the incident as reported, or rather two separate incidents, actually happened. We'll see why this man is said to be a paedophile in a moment, but let's examine first how Amaral describes the alleged paedophile based on Nuno Lorenco's description. Didn't look like a tourist, long brown hair down to his collar, cream-coloured trousers and jacket, shoes of a classic style, and it is claimed that he fled in a hired car. 
Dr. Amaral, who first became aware of this claimed sighting on Saturday the 5th of May, two days after Madeleine's disappearance on the 3rd of May, immediately grasped the significance of this sighting, as perhaps was the intention all along. He wrote in his book, This report reminds us of the individual encountered by Jane Tanner in the streets of Villa de Luz on the evening of Madeleine's disappearance. Let's now examine in depth the statement of Nuno Lorenco and tell his story about a man he suggested was a paedophile who allegedly was taking photographs of young children on a beach and later tried to kidnap his daughter. As we'll see in a moment, the man turned out to be a Polish man from Warsaw named Wojciech Krakowski on a week's holiday in the area, either with his wife or a lady friend. There are a number of very curious features surrounding the story. Nuno Lorenco told his police interviewer, Inspector João Carlos, that he is a Portuguese citizen who emigrated to Germany 14 years previously in 1993. Lorenco says he is the father of a girl aged nearly four and a boy almost three. He says he was on holiday with his wife and children from the 22nd of April to the 13th of May, staying with his mother in Sagres. He goes on to give these details. On Sunday the 29th of April 2007, he says he had just returned his rental car and walked to the nearby Marita Beach in Sagres, arriving there about 3 p.m. It is not clear why he handed in his rental car that day. According to his statement, by that day he had only been there a week and still had two weeks to go on his holiday. They, his wife and two children, all went to the play area, he says. He continues that between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. he noticed a man holding a small silver-coloured camera who was sneakily taking pictures of children on the beach by covertly clicking a camera held near his waist. Lorenko even tells us that he was close enough to hear the clicking of his camera. The man then, says Lorenko, went on to take three or four pictures of Lorenko's children. Lorenko then saw him take pictures of two more boys, aged about nine and five, who were close by and playing with a ball, who were from another Sagres family he already knew. In the English translation of Nuno Lorenko's statement, it states that he had begun staring at this man with a camera indignantly and aggressively, but apparently did not actually confront him. Lorenko adds that before the man left the area, he sneakily took more pictures of all four children and of other children, this time with a camera held to his eye. Furthermore, says Lorenko, he also got on his knees in the sand to take additional photos. After this, says Nuno Lorenko, the man left and he did not see the individual and did not again think about the incident. Not only does he say that he did not think about it any more, but there is no indication that it ever occurred to Lorenko at this point to contact the police. Lorenko then says that at around 6 to 6.30 p.m. the same day, it got a bit colder, so they left the beach and headed towards the promenade to buy sweets at a pastry shop called Marreros, about a quarter of a mile from the beach in Sagres. He and his family sat down, and as he was drinking coffee, he spotted the same man passing the pastry shop and heading for the edge of the promenade. He then adds that the man entered the shop but left immediately and was constantly looking at children. Lorenko continues in the English translation of his statement, As the man left the pastry shop, his three-year-old daughter began racing around the tables as they were ready to leave. Seeing this, the man began to walk rapidly towards Lorenko's daughter as the family were leaving the shop. By chance, his daughter stopped next to him as the man appeared to try to stop them from leaving. The man went into the pastry shop once again and left without buying anything. He then went to the back of a local kiosk. Lorenko then says that he has no doubt that the man intended to abduct his daughter. Therefore, he says, he got out his mobile phone and began taking various pictures of the man. He did so in front of the man so that he would clearly see that he was taking pictures of him. Then Lorenko explains to Inspector Carlos that the photo didn't come out on his mobile because he had his finger on the camera lens. Curiously, although he says he took pictures, in the plural of this man, he only refers to a photo, singular, not coming out. Another point here, is it common for a mobile phone to fail because of a finger over its lens? Lorenko goes on to explain that the man had left the kiosk area. Lorenko followed him. He noticed that the man was now sitting behind the wheel of a newish grey Renault car. Lorenko, who must have taken a biro or pencil down to the beach with him, and some paper, now tells us that he noted the registration number on a piece of paper. A few minutes later, however, he tells us that he threw this piece of paper 
into a rubbish bin or flung it on the ground, he can't remember which, as he didn't think it would be of any further use. Here we have two more points of interest. Once again, despite what he says is this dramatic attempt to snatch his young daughter, he still doesn't even think of contacting the police, nor does he bother to keep the registration number of the car in which the man has driven off. These are more issues that increase one's doubts about the entire story. Then we are told this. Lorenko saw that there was a woman in the passenger seat. He managed to take a photo of the car which his camera said was taken at 6.08pm on Sunday the 29th of April. At least he didn't have his finger in front of the lens this time. And maybe that's because this time he claims that he was taking a photo on his camera, not on his mobile phone. Yet he told the police nothing in his statement about going to get his camera. Has he now got both a mobile phone and a camera? The car is then said to have driven off in the direction of Segres Fortaleza. Here are the two photos said to have been taken by Lorenko that evening. It is not possible from this photograph to see if anyone was in the car, but that is Lorenko's story, i.e. that when he took this photograph, Wojciech Krakowski and his wife were both in the car, presumably about to drive off in haste. This would appear to be his only photograph of the entire incident. His daughter, he says, was nearly snatched by a paedophile brazenly taking pictures of young children on the beach. Yet, according to his account, for the next five days he does nothing more about the incident. Then Lorenko tells the police about a further incident concerning this man, which he says happened on Friday the 4th of May, the day after Madeline was reported missing. Reporting this incident to the police the following day, Inspector Carlos records that Lorenko told him as follows. Yesterday, 4th of May, Friday, he went to a rental car agency. The name of the agency was Turinfo and is located in Sagres. It was around 1 p.m. Again, we find Lorenko at a car rental agency. He told police that he'd returned a car to the rental agency on the 29th of April. What was he doing at a car rental agency again? Was he now hiring another car? He says that the employee at the rental agency told them to return at 1.30 p.m., at which time the manager would arrive. It seems curious that only the manager could rent out cars. Lorenko says that he proceeded to a bar called Razatos Ventos, where he ordered a coffee to pass the time. At a later point, looking out of the bar, he saw the same man, as on the previous Sunday, dressed in exactly the same fashion, he says, but without a hat. This man was alone and on foot and then left the area, and he didn't see him again, nor did he see his car. Upon returning home, says Inspector Carlos, Lorenko recounted the story to his wife, who told him to go to the police. This was because his wife had already, earlier that day, heard on the news about the disappearance of Madeline. Lorenko's daughter apparently bore a striking resemblance to photographs of Madeline. That very morning, 5th of May, Lorenko contacted the police and told them what had happened. Of the vehicle registration plate, he says he only remembered the partial plate, letters AV and numbers 67. So we are asked to believe the following. 1. That it had not occurred to Lorenko to contact the police before the 4th of May. 2. That as he went to the car rental agency, he happened to see the same man again, this time in a different location and three, that only after his wife mentioned Madeleine McCann did he and his wife even think of contacting the police. Even then he delayed visiting the police until the following day, the 5th of May. The full description of the man Lorenko now gives to Inspector Carlos is as follows. Masculine, Caucasian, with Latin colouring, curly dark brown hair that ran down his neck, and in a ponytail, between 35 to 40 years of age, of medium complexion, and around 170 to 175 centimetres in height. He did not have any distinguishing marks or signs and did not wear rings or other jewellery. He wore a cream-coloured beach hat. He also wore dark glasses. He wore cloth trousers and a coat stroke jacket of the same material, which was cream-coloured and was almost the same colour to the hat he had worn previously. His shoes, he thinks, were dark brown and of the type that need to be shined or polished, i.e. leather. There are obvious similarities between the two descriptions of a man that we've looked at so far, Jane Tanner's Tannerman, and now Nuno Lorenko's Sagres man. Tannerman was dark-skinned, while Sagres man had Latin colouring, medium complexion. Tannerman and Sagres man both described as 35 to 40. 
height Tanaman 1.7 meters, Sagres man around 170 to 175 centimeters. Hair Tanaman very dark, thick, longer at the back. Sagres man curly dark brown hair that ran down the back of his neck and in a ponytail. Jacket and trousers both Tanaman and Sagres man were described as wearing jacket and clothes made of the same cloth material who were wearing light colored trousers. Tanaman's jacket was dark, however, while Sagres man was wearing a cloth jacket. Shoes, both Tanaman and Sagres man were described as wearing classic shoes. Both rather strangely were described as not looking like a tourist. This description might stem from Nuno Lorenko's reference to Krukowski and his partner, both wearing rather unusual warm clothing. The striking comparison between the two descriptions is obvious, as Dr. Amaral pointed out so clearly in his book. The stranger, Sagres man, did not look like a tourist, brown hair down to his collar, wearing cream-coloured trousers and jacket and shoes of a classic style. This report reminds us of the individual encountered by Jane Tanner in the streets of Villa de Luz on the evening of Madeline's disappearance. Inspector Carlos's report continues. As regards the woman with the individual, as he saw her seated in the vehicle, he can only state that she had short hair which appeared to be white in colour and very shiny. In the sitting position, her head was below the car headrest. She appeared to be skinny and Caucasian. She did not use glasses. He can say no more, as she was difficult to see. When questioned, the witness states that he could recognize the individual in person and from a photograph or sketch. And indeed, Lorenko did eventually recognize Krakowski from a photograph shown to him by the police once they had traced him. Let's just go back for a moment to the account in Dr. Amaral's book, published in July 2008. Thanks to the father's composure, he managed to take a photograph of the vehicle. It's not very clear and does not allow us to make out the number plate, but we succeed nonetheless in finding the car. The car hire firm provides us with the identity of the driver. He is a 40-year-old Polish man who was travelling with his wife. They arrived in Portugal on April the 28th from Berlin at Faro Airport, they hired a car and stayed in an apartment in Budens near Praia de Luz. Unfortunately, on May the 5th at 7 a.m., they had already left, taking with them their camera and all the photographs from their holiday. We asked the German police through Interpol to monitor them as soon as they arrive in Berlin. All the passengers are questioned, but no one has seen a child looking like Madeleine. In Berlin, the couple take the train to return to Poland. Thus, the Polish trail comes to an end. We would like to have seen their photos, but that proved impossible. It's clear from this, then, that the Portuguese police rapidly set about finding the mystery photographer on Moretta Beach in Sagres, who turned out to be the 40-year-old Polish Wojciech Krakowski. Let's take a brief look into the Portuguese police files, what else they managed to establish about Krakowski. The Renault Clear vehicle, registration number 15AV67, was traced to the headquarters of a car rental company, Luz Car rent -a car The car was rented at Faro Airport on Saturday the 28th of April to Wojciech Krukowski. A hire contract drawn up by Nelson Martins, an employee of the agency, was found. Krukowski and his wife were staying at number 2C in an accommodation block called Edificio Solomar in Ficticia, which appears to be the name of the road in Burgau. The Solomar block was managed by a company called ATB, situated at Main Street, Moretta's Building, Burgau, in the municipality of Villa de Bispo. The police contacted its director, Nuno Felisberto. The apartment actually belonged to Peter and Margaret O, who live in Windsor Grove, Cardiff, Wales. The apartment had not been relet or cleaned after the couple's departure. The key was given to the police in case they wanted to check it, which they did. He had arranged this accommodation via the internet. His reservation email was found. He paid for the accommodation with his credit card. The files tell that Krakowski's vehicle was returned to the hire company on the 5th of May 2007 at Faro Airport and had already been washed and hired out again to one Clare E at Parc de Floresta in Budens, Villa do Bispo. 
Further examination of the released Portuguese files show that they promptly and efficiently conducted their investigations, despite the constant smearing of them in British mainstream press, which claimed they were incompetent. The further information that the police gleaned from their inquiries included the following. The police contacted several business establishments in the area to determine the comings and goings of the Polish couple. One man, the owner of a beach bar, thought he recognised the couple from the police's description of them. He told the police that, one, he recalled that the couple had lunch and dinner there two or three times at the beginning of the week. Two, he knows that they are Polish because they spoke about football on the day of the Liverpool-Chelsea match, Tuesday the 1st of May, saying that Liverpool's goalkeeper was Polish. Three, they also discussed Portuguese and Brazilian classical music. The Polish couple knew several performers from those countries. They asked the owner of the bar where they could buy music of this genre. The owner directed them to the FNAC shop at the Algarve Shopping Centre or to the Chiado Commercial Centre. Four, they said they would probably go to Lisbon the same day. To the restaurateur, the couple seemed quite atypical of holiday makers to that place. They paid in cash, the lady was often irritated and they dressed more formally than you would expect for a summer holiday at a beach. The owner, however, did not perceive any abnormal behaviour from the couple. The police were able to establish that the couple did indeed visit FNAC at the Chiado Commercial Centre on the 2nd of May 2007, where they bought two comedy musical CDs, paid for with a credit card, the same one used to pay the Luz Car Rent-A-Car Company for the hire of the vehicle, registration 15 AV67. The police seized the CCTV and extracted a still photograph of the Polish couple in the shop. Finally, the Portuguese police contacted Interpol in Germany and Poland. This is the information they received. From Interpol Germany, information was sent to Warsaw for them to trace and interview the Polish couple. Air Berlin said that Poles used the connection route via Berlin because there were no direct flights to and from Portugal stroke Faroe. There were no suspicious reservations pertaining to children. Passengers in seats around the Krakowskis were shown pictures of Madeleine. All said that the couple was not accompanied by any child. From Interpol Warsaw, at 7.10 a.m. on Sunday the 6th of May, the Polish police interviewed the couple in their home apartment, which was searched. Madeleine was not found. They had left Berlin by train at 9.22 p.m. on the 5th of May and arrived back in their home at 6.45 a.m. It appears that the police did not check the couple's cameras. Before we move on, we are surely entitled to query why Nuno Lorenko does nothing about his child having been nearly kidnapped for several days, then only bothers to contact the police moments after Krakowski takes off heading back to Poland. And as we've seen, Lorenko's sighting has a dramatic impact on Dr. Amaral and his team. They act instantly, clearly thinking that must be the same man that Jane Tanner saw. Here I must ask the question, was this so-called sighting a complete setup. Suppose there never was an abduction. Suppose that Madeline died much earlier than the alleged abduction and they needed a cover story. What better than to have two separate people, Jane Tanner and Nuno Lorenko, with two near identical descriptions to give to the police soon after they report Madeline missing? Could Nuno Lorenko and Jane Tanner both have based their descriptions on Wojciech Krakowski? were they both handed the same script? I suggest that this scenario is probable. Is it possible that when Lorenko made his dramatic claims to the Portuguese police he already knew, one, that Jane Tanner had already made a statement about a man seen with a child on the evening of the 3rd of May, and two, that Krakowski was already on a plane back to Poland? I suggest he may have made the whole story up. I suggest he went to the police with one tangible piece of evidence, namely a photograph of Krakowski's hired car, and knew the police would soon be able to trace Krakowski. I suggest the alleged attempted kidnapping incident was a fabrication. If so, could this fabrication have been instigated by those closer to the Madeleine incident? Was a story cunningly built with Krakowski as the perpetrator? If so, it succeeded. The Portuguese police were fooled. It seems crystal clear that Krakowski and his lady partner had nothing whatsoever to do with the reported disappearance of Madeleine McCann. 
By the time the Portuguese police had heard from Interpol, presumably sometime on Sunday the 6th of May, there was absolutely no evidence that the couple were in any way connected with Madeleine's disappearance. Yet within five days, there was a spate of well-sourced stories in the British mainstream press claiming that Sagres Mann was the main suspect. How did this come about? Let's now examine some of these stories about Lorenko's claims. Two stories, one in the Daily Mail, the second in the Daily Telegraph, appeared on the 11th and 12th of May 2007 respectively. The first was headed, did Madeleine's abductor target her after family's visit to remote village? Here are some extracts from it. Madeleine McCann and her family visited the same remote village where a suspected paedophile was chased away for photographing young girls. It has emerged. It may have been the moment her abductor first laid eyes on the three-year-old who was snatched from her bed three days later. The McCann's day trip to Pretty Sagres, 16 miles along the coast from Praia de Luz, coincided with reports of a balding man with a blonde woman taking sneaky pictures of youngsters. The sinister couple have become prime suspects in the hunt for missing Madeline. A holiday maker grew suspicious of them after the man began secretly snapping youngsters on the beach. When challenged, he fled in a car with the woman. Officers have now officially ended the ground search for missing Madeline and are concentrating on evidence from witnesses. The McCanns are believed to have visited Sagres, which is on the country's southwest tip and effectively the land's end of mainland Europe, on Monday, April the 30th. A shopkeeper in the town said she remembered them well. She said, on the road into the town, Kate was holding Madeline's hand. On the other side of the road was Jerry with a baby buggy. I remember thinking it odd to see him with a baby buggy because I thought the little girl was too old to need one. She said it was the same day as the stranger taking photographs, although other witnesses said that happened two days later. Either way, it seems possible that Madeline's abductor was watching the beach at Sagres for some time. Holiday maker Nuno Lorenko, who is from Sagres but now lives in Germany, was sitting at a cafe with his German wife and their two children when he noticed a man taking pictures of his four-year-old blonde daughter and other children. He became so concerned at his behaviour that he took his own picture of the man, who was balding with long hair at the back, on his mobile phone. The picture is believed to have inspired Portuguese detectives to produce their infamous egg with hair photo fit of a suspect with a blank face and side parted hair. It was also reported the police have identified two people caught on CCTV at a local petrol station as being a couple renting a holiday apartment in the chocolate box village of Burgau, four miles along the coast. A blonde woman with shoulder length hair and a man with middle parted hair, both about 40, ate breakfast on their terrace of the Solomar apartments according to the Portuguese press. However, the apartment block in question was deserted and neighbours said they knew nothing about it. Let's pause there a moment and consider these elements of the story. The couple caught on CCTV at a local petrol station referred to in the article is, by the way, also Krakowski and his female. First, we note that this account differs from Dr. Conchalo Amaral's account in his book. He writes that the photographer tried to kidnap his daughter. But in his first account of the alleged encounter in the Daily Mail of the 11th of May, we read of no such kidnap event. The report simply says that Lorenko noticed a man taking pictures of his four-year-old blonde daughter and other children and became concerned at his behaviour. There's no mention of the claimed kidnap attempt outside the pastry shop. Amaral obviously had the advantage of seeing Lorenko's witness statement. Amaral clearly believed that Lorenko was a witness of truth. Second, we note how conveniently this story supports the early claims by the McCanns that their daughter was abducted, perhaps by a paedophile. This event, the McCanns' alleged visit to Sagres, which supposedly happened on the 30th of April, was described by the Daily Mail as possibly the moment her abductor first laid eyes on the three-year-old who was snatched from her bed three days later. It was just so easy for the media and hence the public to make the connection. A man tries, so it is said, to snatch a three-year-old blonde girl from the beach days before Madeline is reported missing. Then the McCanns allegedly visit the same remote village of Sagres. It is claimed, in effect, that this photographer tried to snatch a three-year-old girl on Sunday, then saw Madeline and her parents in the village on Monday, 
and then three days later abducted her. It sounds far-fetched, but that is the narrative the Daily Mail readers were invited to follow. Third point, did the McCanns actually visit Sagres on the Monday, as claimed in this article? We have the witness of the shopkeeper, who according to Dr. Amaral, remembered the McCanns well. She said, on the road into the town, Kate was holding Madeline's hand. On the other side of the road was Jerry with a baby buggy. I remember thinking it odd to see him with a baby buggy because I thought the little girl was too old to need one. She said it was the same day as the stranger taking photographs, although other witnesses said that happened two days later. If the McCanns really were in Sagres on Monday the 30th of April, one key question is how did they get there? They told police that they did not have access to a car that week, yet Sagres is 15 or 16 miles from the village of Praia de Luz. The Daily Mail account seems pretty clear. It says Madeleine McCann and her family visited the same remote village and to the McCann's day trip to Pretty Sagres, 15 miles along the coast from Praia de Luz. But when we read Dr Kate McCann's account of that day, Monday the 30th of April, there is no reference whatsoever to this day trip to Sagres. Indeed, there is no mention by the McCanns of a day trip anywhere, never mind Sagres. On the contrary, the crash records kept by Mark Warner show quite clearly that all three children, Sean and Emily and Madeline, were in their crash that day. So these accounts seem impossible to reconcile. Whoever was the source for this story states the McCanns were in Sagres on Monday the 30th of April. A shopkeeper remembers seeing Kate, Jerry, Madeline and a buggy in Sagres but no twins, and there is no mention of this claimed visit in Dr. Kate McCann's detailed account of that week. So what is the truth? Did they go on a day trip to Sagres that day, or not? Where did this story of the day trip to Sagres really come from? The evidence that they were there that day, or any other day, comes only from two British newspapers which don't disclose their sources. The evidence from the unnamed woman who claims to have seen the McCanns and Madeline, but not the twins, is suspect. So I suggest this visit to Sagres may have never happened. All the McCanns' children were recorded in the crash register that day. Even if they did go to Sagres, crash evidence shows Madeline was not with them, as claimed by the woman. It could have been a case of mistaken identity. And how did they get there? They didn't have a car and there was no regular bus service to and from Sagres. The claim that the McCanns were in Sagres that day seems quite unlikely. Far more likely, in my view, is whoever supplied this story to the newspapers, probably someone close to the McCann team, made up the McCanns' visit to Sagres in order to promote the emerging tale that Madeline had been abducted by a paedophile obsessed with very young blonde girls. The paper refers vaguely to this story emerging. From where? From the police? That seems highly unlikely. Surely if the police were still interested in the Polish couple, they would be covertly asking the Polish police to make further inquiries, not placing stories in the British press. And what about the Daily Mail's reference to the sinister couple, the Krakowskis? The mail story was on the 11th of May, yet by the 6th of May, five days earlier, the Portuguese police, the German police, the Polish police and Interpol had all been involved and eliminated the Krakowskis. They had nothing whatsoever to do with Madeleine's disappearance. Yet the Mail, presumably briefed by a source close to the McCann team, had described them as a sinister couple. So now let's look at the Daily Telegraph version of this story the following day. Abductors could have spied on girl for days. Police were last night investigating whether Madeleine McCann was watched by her abductors three days before she was snatched. Detectives have discovered that the McCann family went to the town of Sagres on the southern tip of the Algarve on April the 30th. A witness has told police that on the same day he saw a suspicious man following families and photographing children, including his daughter, a blonde girl strikingly similar to Madeleine. A witness, Nuno Lorenko, said he saw a man following his family down the beach and taking discreet photographs. He said he challenged the man, who fled with a blonde woman in a Renault Clio. This story gives another twist. This time Lorenko, or the Telegraph, is suggesting that he and the McCanns were both in Sagres on Monday the 30th of April, whereas in his statement he says that he and his family were in Sagres the previous day, Sunday the 29th. Which is it? 
He is also quoted as saying that the man was following his family down the beach, taking discreet photographs, and is said to have challenged the man. In his statement, however, he doesn't say that he was followed down the beach, nor did he challenge the man while they were at the beach. He says he only did so at a shop two hours later. The Telegraph article also proclaimed, Detectives have discovered that the McCann family went to the town of Sagres. As we have just seen, that claim is suspect. It seems there was precious little truth in either of these articles. So let's now conclude our look at the alleged sighting of Sagres Man by examining a few more aspects of the story. We'll go back to Dr. Amaral's account of Sagres Man, that is, Wojciech Krakowski. He writes in Chapter 3, We circulate a photo which we obtained thanks to a surveillance camera in a Lisbon shopping mall amongst holidaymakers, clients and employees of Pride de Luz restaurants. Fruitlessly, nobody saw them. On the other hand, employees of the restaurant they usually went to in the Burgau Budens area remember them. The woman was usually in a bad mood and both wore clothes totally inappropriate to the place and the time of year. The forensic police won't be able to investigate their hire vehicle, which we managed to locate, because it has already been rented out again. All that's left to us is to find the bin in which the cleaning team dumped the rubbish left in the vehicle. Analysis of the rubbish reveals nothing. Fortunately, no one else has yet occupied the apartment the couple stayed in. It's low season. We go ahead with a thorough search, looking for evidence of a child's presence, shoe prints, fingerprints or footprints. Nothing. We then gather various hair samples, doubtless coming from adults, and notice drops of blood on a kitchen unit. Nothing conclusive. It's probably from an everyday domestic accident. We know that the apartment that the couple were staying in was in Burgau Budens, known as the Solomar Building. This apartment block in Burgau has interesting links to Robert Murat. His father's company actually built this block, and there are suggestions that the company, ATB, also continues to manage the block to this day. In addition, we know that Robert Murat's uncle, Ralph Everley, provided the CCTV footage to the Portuguese police of the Polish couple visiting his beach bar in Burgau. This is another connection with Murat. It was also at the home of Ralph Everley and his wife Sally that on the 13th of November 2007 a meeting took place between Robert Murat team, Murat, his mother, his aunt Sally and uncle Ralph Everley and Murat's high profile lawyer Francisco Pagaret with the McCann team, the head of their private investigations, Cheshire businessman Brian Kennedy, the McCann's coordinating lawyer and Freemason Edward Smethurst. There is an interesting report in the Portuguese police files concerning DNA found at the Solomar apartment block where Krakowski was staying. Here are two extracts from this report. The first concerns Robert Murat. The haplotype identified by the letters MEM -E star present in 49 samples, 35 in the Residencia Liliana, 13 in the vehicle Volkswagen and one in the bathroom of the apartment in Burgau and identical to that of Robert Murat meaning those samples were from that person or individuals of the same maternal bloodline. The second extract I would highlight is about Jane Tanner. The report reads, The haplotype identified by the letter S, present in two samples, apartment in Burgau, and identical to that of Jane Tanner, meaning those samples were from that person or individuals of the same maternal bloodline. So, what is this suggesting? I am not an expert in genetics, and I would ask the question, is this suggesting that Jane Tanner may have visited the apartment block where Wojciech Krukowski was staying? I am not saying this happened, but if it did, why might she have gone there? As we saw, the Portuguese police were first tipped off about the Polish couple on Saturday the 5th of May, but only after the Polish couple had already left Burgau for Poland. There is also a reference on the Lobster Crash record sheet that week for the daughter of tennis playing Dr. Julian Totman for the 3rd of May, the same crash which Madeleine attended. He writes on the crash sheet, Burgau Walk. It is not clear what is meant by that. Burgau was certainly near enough for someone to walk there and back in a morning or afternoon. Also of interest is that when Jerry McCann returned to Pride de Luz from his trip to Washington, he immediately drove to Villa do Bispo. Villa de Bispo is a small town about 14 miles west of Lagos 
and the centre of the municipality which includes towns such as Sagres, Budens, Burgau and Moretta Beach. The whole story of Sagres man seems could be interconnected in a mysterious way with Robert Murat, his aunt and uncle, the Evelays, and the villages of Burgau and Sagres. So how do Burgau and Sagres fit into the story of that fateful week's events? Is it possible, for example, that this Polish couple were connected to Robert Murat's then girlfriend, now wife, Michaela Walzuk, who was also of Polish origin? I'll finish my look at Sagres Man with a summary of the series of major questions about Sagres Man. Let's briefly list them. On what date did Luna Marenko see Wojciech Krakowski? Did the McCanns visit Sagres as claimed? How credible is the claim that Krakowski tried to snatch Lorenko's daughter away from him outside the pastry shop? Why didn't Nuno Lorenko contact the police immediately on his mobile about the attempted kidnap of his daughter? Why did he report these incidents only after Wojciech Krakowski was already on his way back to Poland? There is a complete lack of corroboration for this story. Where are the witness statements from anyone else on the beach who saw the man with the camera, especially the parents of the two boys, or the witness statements from the people who saw the attempted kidnap, the staff of the shop, the customers, others passing by who would have seen the man run off? I'm not aware that any exist. What about Lorenko's description of the man's actions at the pastry shop? Going through his statement, Lorenko says the man comes in, goes out straight away, then comes back in again. As far as the claim of a kidnap attempt is concerned, there is no mention of him grabbing his daughter's arm or even trying to. The word he uses to refer to this in the English translation of them were as the man appeared to try to stop them from leaving. That is a vague description. How exactly did he appear to try to stop them from leaving? Lorenko doesn't say. There is also the matter of the third alleged encounter with this man on Friday the 4th of May. Lorenko says he went to a car rental agency, Turinfo, in Sagres. It is not stated why he went, though presumably it was about renting a car. According to his witness statement, he was visiting his mother in Sagres, arriving on the 22nd of April and leaving on the 13th of May. It is not immediately obvious why, 12 days after arriving in Portugal, he suddenly visits a car rental agency with just nine days of his holiday left, having already hired a car earlier in the holiday. He certainly doesn't tell us why in his statement. He says he sees the same man in Sagres. This is odd. We have established that the Polish couple were staying in the Solomar apartments in Burgau, which is some distance away from Sagres. Why, when at the beginning of the week, Wojciech Krakowski had practically been chased out of Sagres, had a photo of his face taken outside a pastry shop and been photographed in his car, would he contemplate revisiting Sagres on the last day of his holiday? It is hardly a rational thing to do. And once again, although Lorenko sees the man again, he doesn't contact the police. He only does so a day later. In my judgment, these concerns, and I've mentioned 11 separate issues altogether, raise serious doubts about whether any of Lorenko's story can be believed. To my knowledge, no other local people or tourists can be found who could confirm any of Lorenko's claims. The only other evidence we have about the couple's activities that week comes from a barmaid at the beach bar owned by Robert Murat's uncle, Ralph Everley. It amounts to this. The man talked about Liverpool-Chelsea football match on Tuesday the 1st of May. His wife looked irritated some of the time. They talked about their love of Portuguese and Brazilian comedy music. And the Polish couple went to a local music shop in the Algarve on Wednesday the 2nd of May. They dined several times at Ralph Everley's beach bar and that's it. The claim that the Polish man may have seen Madeleine with the McCanns at Sagres fails because from the evidence available it looks like the McCanns may have never went there. That claim by the mystery shopkeeper who says she saw Kate holding Madeleine's hand with Jerry McCann on the other side of the road with a baby buggy also seems doubtful. In his book Dr Amaral complains that on Sunday the 6th of May the day gets off to a difficult start with bad news from Poland. From all accounts the police badly misinterpreted our request for collaboration. All they did was approach the couple and verify that Madeleine was not with them. But they didn't seize either their photographic equipment or the photos taken during their holiday. Another lead that remains pending. 
perhaps it would have led to the discovery of a paedophile ring. Well, if Amaral had had the benefit of the seven years more knowledge of the twists and turns in this case that we have all had since he was booted off the inquiry, perhaps not. Wojciech Krakowski can hardly be considered a potential paedophile on the slender basis of Nuno Lorenko's tales. Maybe if Amaral could have a look again at all the evidence about Sagres' man, he might now consider that he and his men may have been tricked by what looks like it could be a fabricated sighting. To sum up, the whole story of Sagres Man is shot through with significant contradictions and mysteries. There is no credible evidence to my knowledge that the Polish man was photographing anyone, still less that he tried to kidnap anyone. Was this a fabrication designed partly to put the Portuguese police off the scent and also to give an exciting news angle on Madeleine's abduction to the hungry British mainstream media? They certainly are burying this story. So far, we've looked at what could be total fabrications of an abductor. Now I'm going to come on to another claimed sighting of an abductor carrying away a child on the evening of the 3rd of May by members of an Irish family, the Smiths. This is considered so crucial that Scotland Yard put this sighting at the very centre of their investigation into Madeline's disappearance. I'm calling him Smith Man. Less than five weeks after Madeline's reported disappearance, and soon after Jerry McCann made his announcement to the world about a man seen on the 3rd of May who might have been carrying a child, the Drogheda Independent first broke the news that there had been a second apparent sighting of a man carrying a child that night. Members of an Irish family, the Smiths, from Drogheda, headed by grandfather Martin Smith, had apparently informed the Garda, the Irish police, who in turn informed the Portuguese police, that they had seen a man walking down towards the beach in Pride de Luz at about 10 p.m. the night Madeline vanished, apparently after they had all come out of Kelly's bar. Further coverage of Martin Smith followed in other newspapers. His photo was published in one of them, and references were made to him knowing Robert Murat well. Smith was so upset by these references to Murat that he took legal action against the newspaper. I mentioned Martin Smith briefly in my recent film about Madeline, buried by mainstream media. In my film, I described Martin Smith and Murat as friends. Some days after I published my film, I received an email purporting to be from Martin Smith. His email was short and to the point. It said, Dear Mr. Hall, I have just watched the four parts of your new film, Buried by Mainstream Media, etc., which I found very interesting. I would like to point out a major inaccuracy near the end of part four of the film, where it was stated that I was friends with Robert Murat. This statement is untrue, and I would like it corrected. I had come across Mr. Murat twice in the previous twelve months, had never been introduced to him, and merely knew him by sight. Yours sincerely, Martin Smith. I asked him to verify his identity, and he sent me an image of what he said was his current driving license. I am happy to accept this, that he and Murat were not friends. In my email reply to Martin Smith, I asked him for an interview, but he declined. Nine of the family were on holiday there on the day Madeline was reported missing. Martin Smith claimed that they saw a man carrying an infant girl walking down the Rua de Escola Primaria around 10 p.m. His statement in the police files said, as he reached the main road, he crossed by an individual holding a child. He was walking downhill in the opposite direction. He is not aware where this person was heading. He only saw him as they passed each other. He assumed it was a father and daughter and thought nothing more of it. It must have been around 10 p.m. Martin Smith is known to have stated to the media that he and Robert Murat had, quote, met several times. As we shall see in a moment, a key issue in our discussion of Smithman will be Martin Smith's insistence, when interviewed by the Portuguese police on the 26th of May, that although he did not get a good view of the man he said he saw carrying a young child, he could be absolutely certain that the man he saw was not Robert Murat. The quote from the police file states, He states that it is not possible to recognise the individual in person or by photograph. He, Smith, was not wearing glasses on this occasion. He adds that in May and August of 2006, he saw Robert Murat in Prior de Luz bars. On one of these occasions, 
he was inebriated and spoke to everyone. He also states that the individual who carried the child was not Robert. He would have recognised him immediately. Just for the record, here are statements I have found in the media and police files about this point. From his witness statement, in May and August 2006, he saw Robert Murat in Praia de Luz bars. On one of these occasions, the first, he was inebriated and spoke to everyone. From the Drogheda Independent, 8th of August 2007, the family are also mystified at reports that he knows Mr. Murat. They met once in a bar about two years ago. My dad would only know Mr. Murat by sight. On Sky News, 4th of January 2008, Martin Smith said, I told police it was definitely not him because the man wasn't as big as Murat. I think I would have recognised him because I had met him several times previously. And finally, the Daily Mail, the 3rd of January 2008. Insisting he knew chief suspect Robert Murat visually for years, Mr Smith told police the person he saw carrying a child could not be him. What we can say with certainty is that on the basis of these quotations, Martin Smith knew Robert Murat's appearance well enough to be sure, he maintains, that the man he saw wasn't Murat. There we must leave it. Except that his absolute insistence that the man he says he saw was not Robert Murat is one of many matters we now need to look at regarding his sighting. In doing so, I'm going to examine in depth all that we know about the sighting by the Smith family, using the witness statements made public by the Portuguese police, statements by the police themselves, newspaper reports about the sighting and other evidence. To my knowledge, these issues have not been discussed in detail in our mainstream media. We need to do so because this sighting, according to a BBC Crime Watch programme shown in October 2013, was now absolutely central to Scotland Yard's investigation. As I mentioned, the first ever news of the Smith sighting came in an article in this local newspaper, the Drogheda Independent, on the 6th of June 2007, and 11 days after they were interviewed by the police in Portugal. The report told us, local family may have seen missing Maddy. The Drogheda family may have been the last people to see abducted four-year-old Madeleine McCann in Portugal. The family is understood to have seen a child in the arms of a man on the night and at the time Madeleine was taken from her parents' apartment in Praia de Luz. They have reported the matter and recently gave statements to the Portuguese police. The Portuguese police have asked the family not to speak to the press in case they compromise their investigations. The family declined to give any details to the Drogheda Independent. It is not known who leaked this information to the Drogheda Independent. I will begin my examination of this sighting with an absolutely crucial aspect of it. That is, when Martin Smith and his family first told police about it. On the day Madeleine was reported missing by the McCanns, Martin Smith was holidaying at his holiday apartment in the Estra de Luz complex in Praia de Luz. With him were eight other members of his family. His son Peter, his daughter-in-law Sheila and their two children aged 13 and 6, two other grandchildren aged 10 and 4, the children of his daughter Barbara. That made nine of them all together, four adults and five children. On the evening of the 3rd of May, Martin Smith and his family went out for a meal at the Dolphin Restaurant in Praia de Luz. For some of the family, it was their last night in Praia de Luz. Peter and his family had booked their flight home the next morning. The police verified that the Smith family ate at the Dolphin Restaurant that evening by finding the bill from the restaurant's till receipts. They finished their meal at about 9.30pm that evening. Then they say they went to Kelly's Bar for a drink on their way back to their apartment. An examination of the bar receipts for that night do not prove that they all went in for a drink. Only four receipts cover the period they were in Kelly's bar. None of the receipts show drinks bought for an entire family. The receipts are for perhaps two or three drinks. Unfortunately, the police do not seem to have asked the Smiths any questions about what drinks they ordered. On their own account, they were only there for a short time, maybe arriving at Kelly's Bar around 9.35pm and apparently leaving no more than 20 minutes later at around 9.55pm. The police checked out their story at Kelly's Bar with the manager and his staff. A police statement said, On the 10th of October at around 3pm we went to Kelly's Bar. We were received by an employee of the bar who had been on duty on the night of the 3rd of May 2007. When questioned whether she remembered the visit to the bar by witness Martin Smith and his family, she replied that she does not remember. 
given the lapse of time between the events and because the bar is daily frequented by dozens of clients of different nationalities. So there is some doubt about whether all of them stopped off for a drink at Kelly's bar that night. One thing that would have confirmed their story is the CCTV camera outside the Estrella de Luz complex. Unfortunately, by the time the police got to examine it, all the footage that night had been wiped. The Smith's account is of a man carrying a young blonde girl in pyjamas as the nine members of the family were walking back to their apartment. Most of them say they remembered seeing him, although only three members that we know of made statements to the police. The Smiths say it was dark at the time they saw him, around 10pm. It was a cold early May night, the temperature down to around 13 degrees centigrade. In the area where they saw him, the street lighting was weak. Each one glimpsed at him for a few seconds at the most as he walked past them. None of them say they got a clear view of his face. The three members of the family who made formal statements, Martin Smith, the grandfather, and his two children, Peter and Eva, each told police that if they ever saw this man again, they would not be able to recognise him. These are important matters I will return to when we examine the claims that the Smiths, one year after their sighting, were apparently able to draw up these two efits of the man they say they saw, as shown by Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood on the BBC Crime Watch programme in October 2013. Their sighting must have been a memorable and fairly unusual sight. A man walking the streets of a small town carrying an infant dressed only in pyjamas. No one with him, no buggy or pushchair, no coat or blanket covering the child. The following day in this village there was an international media storm. The whole of Praia de Luz and its surroundings were crawling with police officers and hundreds of people from Praia de Luz and the surrounding villages were searching for Madeline as well. The mainstream news media had clearly been tipped off very early that this was going to be a major story. Not only did Madeleine McCann become the top story at breakfast time the following day, but by lunchtime the world's media were descending on the small town in droves. By mid-morning could anyone have been unaware that a three-year-old British girl was missing? Martin Smith, his wife, his daughter Eva and two grandchildren stayed in Praia de Luz for a further week while his son Peter and his family flew home to Ireland. The next day, 5th of May, just the same. Villagers, police, camera crews, journalists, everywhere. Madeleine was the top news item in Portugal, Britain, Ireland and all over the world. The police and the media were appealing for anyone with information to come forward. The Smith family had apparently seen a man carrying a blonde girl clad only in pyjamas late on the night in question. And days went by, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th of May. On Wednesday the 9th of May, Martin Smith and his family flew back to their home in Drogheda Island. The 10th, the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th and 15th went by. All this time, Madeleine remained top of the news on the TV and front pages of all the national newspapers in both Ireland and Britain. It wasn't until Wednesday the 16th of May, 13 days after Madeleine was reported missing, that the Smiths decided to report their sighting. So what was it, after 13 days of media frenzy, that prompted Martin Smith to contact the Irish police? Let us bear in mind that the one thing that Martin Smith was certain of when he made his formal statement to the police was that the man he claimed he'd seen for those fleeting few seconds was not Robert Murat. And why did he phone the police on that particular day, the 16th of May? Let's review what was happening to Robert Murat during this period. Murat is of English heritage but spent much of his early life in Portugal. He speaks fluent English and Portuguese. At the time the McCanns had their fateful holiday in Portugal, he was living part of the year in England and part in Portugal, where he had business interests. He had a young daughter in Norfolk, but was separated from his wife and going through a divorce. Whilst living in Norfolk, he acted as an official translator for Norfolk Police. On the day the McCanns began their holiday in Praia de Luz, Saturday the 28th of April 2007, Murat was staying with his sister in Devon and, he says, renovating his grandmother's house. She had recently died. On Monday the 30th of April, just two days later, we know that he booked a ticket to fly to Portugal early the very next morning. According to Murat, he had been summoned to Portugal because he urgently needed to discuss his business affairs there. Murat had a girlfriend in Portugal, Michaela Walsuk, 
Her vision of events was that she had asked Murat to come over immediately because she was fed up waiting for Murat's divorce to come through. Had something happened the previous day, Sunday the 29th, which meant that he was urgently needed by someone. These are matters I hope to go into in depth in another film focusing on the role of Robert Murat in this whole affair. In the event, in the early hours of Monday the 1st of May, his sister drove him to Exeter Airport. By 9.30am that morning, his plane had already touched down at Faro Airport. He then seems to have embarked on a round of meetings with Michaela, with his lawyer Francesco Pagaret, and with various business contacts and local people. On Friday the 4th of May, so he says, he woke up and learned from a passerby that a young British girl was missing. He immediately went up to the Ocean Club reception, spoke to the police and offered his services as a translator. His offer was readily accepted, given the sheer number of English people that the police now had to interview. And Murat was given the lead translating role, interpreting many important witness statements. But as he did so, suspicions about him grew. A journalist writing for The Mirror and The Independent, Laurie Campbell, is said to have spread rumours about him. I called um, Leicestershire Police back in the UK on Monday. Why? Um, because I was very suspicious about this man and his behaviour. Some of the stories that he was telling didn't ring true, his facts didn't add up. Um, he was being very vague about his background and he seemed far too interested and ready to give information to the media. Campbell had previously worked closely with Clarence Mitchell, Tony Blair's top media manipulator, who was appointed by the government three days after Madeleine disappeared to be the McCann's public relations spokesman and reputation manager. Then Murat started exhibiting some strange behaviour whilst translating for the police. Let's look at some observations made by one of the police officers, Inspector Pedro Veranda, who worked on the Madeleine McCann investigation. He was so concerned about him that he wrote this report to be found in the police's records of the inquiry. Let's just list the allegations made against Robert Murat. 1. Displaying an unusual curiosity about the investigation. 2. Insistently and repeatedly questioned me about the identity of possible suspects. 3. Insistently and repeatedly questioned me about the strategy outlined by the head of the investigation. 4. Insistently and repeatedly questioned me about the work that might possibly have been considered for the coming days. 5. Unusual and absolutely inappropriate behaviour. 6 covertly trying to catch glimpses of various items being prepared for the case files, seven, persistently trying to influence the conduct of the investigation. Inspector Veranda was also concerned that Murat manifested an enormous knowledge about the function of the Ocean Club and manifested enormous knowledge about the routines followed by the McCann family. The question that we might well ask about all this is, was this merely Murat's personal curiosity about the investigation or was he acting on someone else's instructions? Following these developments, on Sunday the 13th of May, there was an informal police identity parade with Jane Tanner. The police put her in a police van with a two-way mirror and caused several people to walk by the van. Robert Murat was one of those who walked by. As Dr. Conchalo Amaral says in his book, Jane Tanner was adamant. Robert Murat was the man she had seen carrying the child near the McCann's apartment ten days earlier. As we may discuss in another film, Murat looked nothing like the man Tanner later sketched as the abductor. Later, Tanner admitted that she had been wrong to identify him. Not only did Jane Tanner insist that Murat was the abductor, but also MI5, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Service and criminal profilers for the British security services had been hard at work profiling Murat as the likely abductor. Now let's see how Gonchalo Amaral dealt with this issue in his book. He wrote, Members of the British Agency SEOP, Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre, take a close interest in Murat and work to develop his psychological profile. The English specialists have continued to refine the profile of the suspect there is a 90% chance that he is the guilty party. So it was that on Tuesday the 15th of May, on the basis of Tanner's insistence that Murat was the man with the child she'd seen on the evening of the 3rd of May, and on the basis of British intelligence officers saying that Murat fitted the likely profile of the abductor, the police pulled in Robert Murat for questioning. Immediately after his police interview, 
the police made Robert Murat the first formal suspect in the case. There was another media storm, with the press full of lurid stories which clearly implicated him as the likely abductor. OK, so how does this fit in with the sighting by the Smith family? What is very curious is that for 13 days none of the Smith family appear to have done anything to contact the police about seeing a man carrying a child dressed only in pyjamas in the dark on the night Madeline was reported missing. Yet, as far as we know, the very day after Murat is made a formal suspect, Martin Smith, for the first time, tells the police about his sighting. He then flies to Portugal ten days later, the 26th of May, and is interviewed by the police, and one thing Smith is adamant about is that the man he saw was not Robert Murat. Is this timing just coincidence? This is how the investigation coordinator, Dr. Cachalo Amaral, put it in his book. He wrote, The Smiths learn that, according to Jane Tanner's statements, Murat is definitely the man encountered on the night of the abduction. Mr. Smith then gets in touch with the Irish police to relate what he saw on the night of the 3rd of May. He insists categorically that the man they came across with the little girl in his arms was not Robert Murat. He is sure of it because he knows him. Let's examine why Martin Smith is said to have first contacted the police. The first story given by Martin Smith about why he had delayed so long was given in the Daily Mail in an article by Vanessa Allen on the 3rd of January 2008. Quote, we were home two weeks when my son rang up and asked, was he dreaming? Or did we meet a man carrying a child the night Madeline was taken? We all remembered that we had the same recollection. I felt we should report it to the police. Further on in the same report, we read this quote. Initially, the Smith family thought nothing more of the encounter, and even the next day when the story broke, they still didn't make the connection. We were home two weeks when my son rang me up and asked, Was he dreaming? Or did we meet a man carrying a child the night Madeline was taken? We all remembered the same recollection, and I felt we should report it to the police, said Mr. Smith. The same story was given to the Drogheda Independent six days later, on the 9th of January 2008. This time Martin Smith's son, Peter, is quoted. He said, It was only after we were home two weeks that I remembered seeing him. At the time, my attention was focused on looking after my wife. When I mentioned it, it jogged my father's memory, and he too remembered seeing the same man, Peter added. He went on. We knew that what we had seen was so vague that we couldn't identify the guy. Pausing for a moment, let's bear this in mind as we proceed. What we had seen was so vague that we couldn't identify the guy. Madeline's apparent abduction had been the top news story for two weeks. Neither Martin nor Peter Smith made any reference to the fact that it was on the day immediately following Marat being made a suspect that Peter started thinking about the man they'd seen two weeks earlier. Let's look at what he told the Portuguese police in his witness statement. He only became aware of Madeline's disappearance the next morning from his daughter in Ireland. She had sent him a message or called him regarding what had happened. At this point, he thought that Madeline could have been the child that he saw with the individual. Bear in mind, the townspeople and police were crawling all over Praia de Luz from the early hours of that first Friday morning looking for Madeline. He tells the police that, on receiving this phone call from his daughter, he thought that Madeline could have been the child he saw with the individual. So why, we must ask, did he not contact the police that very day, when the sighting should have been crystal clear in his mind? Why delay a whole 13 days? Now we'll move to the evidence of Peter Smith and examine what he says the reason for not contacting the police about their claimed sighting. It's in his statement to the police, quote, he only found out about the disappearance of a child the next morning through someone he knew, the son of the builder of Estrella de Luz, who was also at the airport. At the time, he did not associate the said individual with the disappearance. Only after thinking on the subject and the coincidence of the time did he infer that Madeline could have been the child carried by the individual that he had seen. This same account is also featured in the Drogheda Independent. In its edition of the 8th of August 2007, a family member, possibly Peter again, is quoted as saying, We returned to Ireland the next day, and because the reported abduction times didn't originally match, we never had cause to examine their journey that night. The newspaper added, As it emerged that Madeline was abducted around the same time, one of the family members had a flashback of the moment some time later and encouraged the others to jog their memory. 
they remembered passing a man walking towards the beach with a child in his arms. Other than his approximate height and the fact that he was wearing beige clothes, they cannot be more specific than that. We are annoyed at how vague our description is, said the family member. Once again, the family member states how vague our description is. Here is the same account, once again in the Sun, 3rd of January 2008. Their report reads, The Smiths were leaving Kelly's Bar between 9.50 and 10pm on May the 3rd last year. They flew home to Ireland the next day, but when the times of Maddie's abduction were revealed, the family remembered seeing a man, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9 inches tall, and dressed in beige carrying a child. Significantly, the description matches that given by Jane Tanner, 37, a friend of the McCann's. And that leads to another reason the media claim the Smiths contacted the police 13 days after Madeline was reported missing. They claim that it was because their recollection of the man's clothing matched descriptions of his clothing given out in the press. This is how the Daily Mail reported the matter on the 3rd of January 2008. Their description of the barefoot child and the man who wore beige trousers echoes that of Miss Tanner. The coincidence prompted them to contact police after they returned to Ireland. Mr Smith said, Luz is such a small place and so quiet, we felt the duty to tell the police let them, and let them decide if it was important. So here we come up against a problem about the media's version of events. It is claimed they were prompted to contact the police because of one of two things. Either one, because they had heard that the time of the abduction was nearer to 10pm than previously announced or two, because they had heard that the description of the clothing of the alleged abductor coincided with their own recollection. We have problems with both these claims, because when Martin Smith contacted the police in Drogheda on the 16th of May, no one knew about Jane Tanner and her description of the man she said she had seen. There had been no mention of it at all in the media. On the subject of the time of the alleged abduction, various times were given in the media during the initial storm. A Portuguese newspaper reflected the accepted view on its report of the 5th of May when it said that the abduction took place between 9pm and 10pm. The Independent on the same day said, But when Miss McCann, a GP, checked at 9.45pm, Madeline, known to her family as Maddie, had gone. The Guardian the same day, quoting a cousin, said, Mrs Cameron said the couple checked on the children every half hour. The last check was made after 9pm by Mr McCann, sometime between then and around 10 p.m. when his wife walked into the room to find Madeline missing. The family believes an intruder broke in and snatched the girl. Dozens of other reports said similar things. Madeline was taken or abducted between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. If the Smiths were not motivated to contact the police because of either of these two reasons, we can ask this question. Could the fact that they first contacted the police the day after a man they knew of was pulled in for questioning be significant? Why did Martin Smith make it clear in his statement he was absolutely certain the man was not Robert Murat? One problem we have is we can't be sure whether Smith was asked whether he thought the man could be Murat or whether he volunteered the information without being asked. Here is the actual wording of the police report. In May and August of 2006, he saw Robert Murat in Pryor de Luz bars. On one of these occasions, he was inebriated and spoke to everyone. He also states that the individual who carried the child was not Robert. He would have recognised him immediately. We should also bear in mind the quote from Gonzalo Amaral's book. The Smiths learn that, according to Jane Tanner's statements, Murat is definitely the man encountered on the night of the abduction. Mr Smith then gets in touch with the Irish police to relate what he saw on the night of the 3rd of May. He insists categorically that the man they came across with the little girl in his arms was not Robert Murat. He is sure of this because he knows him. Despite the different reasons cited in the media for contacting the police that we discussed, Gonzalo Amaral's book seems to suggest a motive. I must make it clear here that I am not stating that this was Martin Smith's motive. I am just asking the question. At the time Martin Smith contacted the police, it was known publicly that Murat had just been made a suspect. But there was no mention publicly that anyone had been seen carrying a child. Only those close to the investigation at that time would have known about claims of a man carrying a child. 
And here's another question we need to consider. If someone had told him that Jane Tanner had identified Murat, could that person also have passed on to Martin Smith a copy of Jane Tanner's original description of the alleged abductor? That might account for the Smith's description of the abductor being almost identical to Jane Tanner's, which we'll look at now. Again, I am not stating this as fact, I am asking questions. Earlier I referred to a number of things the Smiths said about the man and child they saw. One family member said, we are annoyed at how vague our description is. Peter Smith said, it was so vague that we couldn't identify the man. They saw him in the dark with weak street lighting. They only saw him for a few seconds. He had his head down according to at least one member of the family. Others said the child he was carrying meant you couldn't see his face properly. Bear in mind these statements when considering the details the Smith family, Martin, his son Peter and his daughter Aoife, gave in Portimao Police Station on Saturday the 26th of May in their witness statements. Much of what they recalled of the man I am calling Smith Man matched the description of the man I am calling Tanner Man, the man Jane Tanner said she saw. The following 16 details were identical in each case. 1. In neither case could the man's face be seen. 2. He was an unaccompanied male. 3. He was carrying a child and had no buggy or pushchair. 4. The child was a girl. 5. The child was barefoot. 6. The child was wearing light-coloured stroke pink pyjamas. 7. She looked about 4 years old. 8. She was being held on the man's left side. 9. She didn't have a blanket or other covering. 10. The man didn't look like a tourist. 11. The man was wearing a dark jacket. 12. The man was wearing light-coloured trousers. 13. The man was about 1.75 metres to 1.8 metres tall. 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10. 14. The man was aged about 30 to 40. 15. The man was of average build. 16. They were spotted within 600 yards of each other. When news of this second sighting of an abductor became known, there was much speculation about the identities of both Tanner Man and Smith Man. Some suggested that the descriptions were so close that it must be the same man. Others pointed out that according to Jane Tanner, she saw the man at 9.15pm, whereas the Smith man sighting occurred around 10pm. They reasoned how unlikely it was that any abductor would be seen walking around for up to 45 minutes with a child they had just abducted. Most abductors, they said, would have made away rapidly in a car, assuming the abduction was planned. The uncanny similarity between the two descriptions, however, raises another awkward possibility. Namely, had the Smith family members not actually seen anyone at all, but merely copied from the description of Tanner Man. And again, I am not stating this as truth. I am stating it as a question. It might be a possibility based on the information we have available. Although no description of Tanaman had yet been made public, the McCanns and their group of friends obviously knew of the description. So almost certainly Robert Murat would have known. After all, for several days following Madeline's disappearance, he spent most of the day in the police station translating for a series of witnesses and talking to the police. I raise the possibility, although I am not saying this is true, that Martin Smith may have secretly been informed of Jane Tanner's description of Tanaman, mainly because, as we've seen, the descriptions of Tanaman and Smithman are so strikingly similar. And again, I am not stating these as known facts, only hypothesising based on what I know. I have asked Martin Smith in emails twice if he would be interviewed by me on camera to clear up these issues. On the first occasion he declined, and on the second, to date, he has not replied. In fact, I am not aware of any interviews the Smiths have given on camera. Earlier I suggested that the descriptions of both Sagresman and Tanaman could have been based on the same source, namely the oddly dressed Wojciech Krakowski. If in turn Smithman was based on Tanaman, then all three descriptions would turn out to be based on Wojciech Krakowski. Let's look at these descriptions. 1. The face. Sagresman, 
Caucasian with Latin colouring of medium complexion. Tanner man, dark-skinned individual, couldn't see his face. Smith man, difficult to see his face in the dark, didn't appear to have a beard or moustache. 2. The age. Sagres man, between 35 to 40 years of age. Tanner man, aged 35 to 40. Smith man, Martin Smith says 35 to 40. Peter Smith says about 35, maybe older, while Aoife Smith suggests 20 to 30. 3. Height. Sagres man, around 170 to 175 centimetres in height, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9. Tanner man, about 1.7 metres tall, 5 foot 7. Smith man, Martin and Peter Smith say he was about 1.75 metres to 1.8 metres tall, 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 11. Aoife Smith says 1.7 to 1.75, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9. 4. The hair. Sagres man, Curly dark brown hair that ran down to the back of his neck and in a ponytail. Tanner man, very dark, thick hair, longer at the back. Smith man, all the Smiths say his hair was brown and shortish. Ether says his hair colour was light brown, thick and long on top. 5. The jacket. Sagres man, he wore a cream coloured cloth coat stroke jacket of the same material as his trousers. Tanner man, wearing a dark duffy type jacket, but not that thick, a sort of anorak of the same material as his trousers. Smith man, the man was wearing a dark jacket. Martin Smith couldn't remember what top the man was wearing when first questioned, but later remembered that he wore a darkish top. 6. The trousers. Sagres man, he wore cloth trousers of the same material as his jacket. Tanner man, he was wearing linen type chino style cloth trousers, beige to golden in colour, like quartzite of the same material as his jacket. Smith man, the man was wearing light coloured trousers. Aoife Smith says beige in colour, cotton fabric, thicker than linen. Martin Smith says he was wearing cream or beige coloured cloth trousers in a classic cut. 7. The shoes. Sagres man, his shoes he thinks were dark brown and of the type that needed to be shined or polished, i.e. leather. In his book, Dr. Conchalo Amaral says they were shoes of a classic type. Tanner man, his shoes were dark in colour, classic type. Smith man, no comments made. 8. The build. Sagres man, no comment made. Tanner man, slim physical appearance. Smith man, the Smiths all say average build, except that Martin Smith says he had an average build, a bit on the thin side. 9. Not a tourist. Sagres man, no comment made, but Gonchalo Amaral writes in his book, Chapter 3, The Stranger Did Not Look Like a Tourist. Tanaman, by the way he was dressed, he gave her the impression that he was not a tourist, because he was very warmly dressed. Smithman, the man didn't look like a tourist. The Portuguese police report Martin Smith's evidence on this point as follows. Urged, he states that the individual did not appear to be a tourist. He cannot explain this further. It was simply his perception given the individual's clothing. The three descriptions are not exactly the same, but the similarities are obvious. Let's look further at mainstream media reports about the Smith Man sighting. In The Sun, 3rd of January 2008, Mary Smith is asked about the claimed sighting and says, we didn't think anything of it. But in another paper, the Daily Mail, on the same day, Martin Smith is quoted as saying that his wife, without warning, approached the man with the question, oh, is she asleep? He is said to have ignored her. Mary Smith declined to make a statement to the police confirming her evidence. Moreover, neither Martin Smith nor his two children, who did make police witness statements, referred to this alleged encounter in their statements. So, did Mary Smith not think anything of it? Or did she approach the man and ask him a question? In the same Daily Mail article, far from not thinking anything of it, Martin Smith is quoted as saying, It was a disturbing encounter. Later, in the same report, we get more details. An Irish holidaymaker has spoken publicly for the first time of his disturbing encounter with a man carrying a child wrapped in a blanket on the night Madeleine McCann disappeared. 
the sighting is strikingly similar to one by a friend of the McCann's, Jane Tanner. In hindsight, the retired Mr. Smith said the man's rude behaviour should have aroused his suspicions. Martin Smith said, The one thing we noted afterwards was that he gave us no greeting. My wife Mary remembered afterwards that she asked him, Oh, is she asleep? But he never acknowledged her one way or another. He just put his head down and averted his eyes. This is very unusual in a tourist town at such a quiet time of the year. So Martin Smith described this as a disturbing encounter with a man who behaved rudely and was very unusual. The Mail article continued, Mr Smith said it was some time before the family realised they could be star witnesses. We were out the night it happened. We went home about 9.50pm and we heard nothing at all about Madeleine McCann until the next day. I was taking my son Peter to the airport and on my way back I heard that a kidnapping happened in the village of Luz. We were looking at all the commotion on Sky News, and we really felt quite helpless. We had two grandchildren with us at the time, aged four and five, and it had a terrible effect on them. They all wanted to sleep in the same room as us until we went home on the Wednesday. We see contradiction here with Mary Smith's We Didn't Think Anything Of It, and her husband's He Was Rude, It Was Very Unusual, Disturbing. One odd feature of this Daily Mail report was that the child was wrapped in a blanket. One wonders where that came from, as none of the three Smiths who made statements mentioned a blanket. They all insisted she was dressed only in pyjamas. Here is what three of the Smiths said in their official witness statements. Aoife Smith said that she didn't see the child's face because she was lying vertically against the man's left shoulder. Peter Smith said the girl was asleep, her eyelids were closed. Martin Smith says the man didn't speak, nor did the child, as she was in a deep sleep. Martin Smith said he put his head down. His son Peter, he did not try to hide his face, nor did he lower his gaze. Another issue is how Martin Smith's memory seemed to improve between making his first statement on the 26th of May 2007 and a second one in January 2008. In May 2007, the police asked him to describe what the man was wearing. In a statement he signed, he wrote, He did not notice the body clothing and cannot describe the colour or fashion of the same. By January, eight months later, he was able to say, The man was wearing beige trousers and darkish top, maybe a jacket or blazer. To our knowledge, neither Martin Smith nor his two children, in May 2007, could remember what the man was wearing above his waist. Peter Smith said that he also does not remember the clothing the individual wore or his shoes. His younger sister, Aoife Smith, said that she did not see what he was wearing above his trousers, as the child covered him almost completely at the top. So it is interesting that Martin Smith claimed over eight months later that the man was wearing a darkish top, maybe a jacket or blazer. I'm now going to look at the extraordinary claim made by Martin Smith over four months after he first reported his sighting. On the 20th of September, he phoned Leicestershire Police. This time he made the claim that the man he had seen over four months ago may have been Jerry McCann. Let's see how this development came about. Why did he think this? Because, he said, he had seen Jerry McCann on his return to England on the 9th of September on a TV news bulletin walking down the steps of his plane, carrying his son Sean on his left shoulder. And how did that enable him to say it was Jerry McCann that he saw back on the 3rd of May? Gonchalo Amaral supplies an answer in his book. It was, quote, that way of carrying his child, that way of walking. So it was the way Jerry McCann was carrying his son Sean down the steps of the plane that made his mind go back and think it probably was Jerry McCann that he saw. Remember, he saw the man for a second or two in the dark over four months ago. When carrying a child who is asleep or very tired, a natural way to carry your child, if you have no buggy or pushchair, is on one shoulder. The twins were just two and a half years old. It's normal for passengers with an infant that age to carry their child down steep aircraft steps on their shoulder. And it appears that Martin Smith didn't inform the police immediately he saw the news broadcast. The evidence suggests that he waited several days before doing so, 11 days in fact, 
as Leicestershire police records seemed to show that Smith made the call on the 20th of September. He added that he was 60 to 80 percent sure it was Jerry McCann, based it seems on the way he was carrying his infant son on his shoulder. Conchalo Amaral was told the news. He made provisional arrangements to interview Martin Smith again, but on the 2nd of October he was taken off the investigation by the Chief of Police and replaced by Paolo Rabello, and there the matter rested until the McCann team began contacting Martin Smith and his family probably around December 2007. And as I will show in a moment, very soon the McCann team began placing significance on the Smith man sighting. Given that Martin Smith had been 60 to 80 percent sure in September that he had really seen Jerry McCann that night in May, that seems like a remarkable turnaround. I should also mention here another statement to be found in the police files of a sighting by a couple in the early hours of the 5th of May, just over 24 hours after Madeline was reported missing. This alleged sighting was in Alvor, about 10 miles east of Praia de Luz. They say they saw a white van which pulled up in the middle of the road. A man got out carrying a child and staggered up a bank in a drunken manner. Soon after, they saw a woman who appeared worried. One of the witnesses, Richard McCluskey, after giving his initial statement to the police on the 9th of May, contacted the police again four months later in September to give a second statement, in which he said, I have watched a good deal of news coverage about the McCanns over the past week or so. Another thing which has played on my mind is the coverage of Mr. McCann walking off the aeroplane holding one of his young children. The way he was holding the child over his left shoulder reminded me of the man carrying the child from the white van in Portugal. There is a great deal of coincidence with regards this sighting and the Smith sighting. Both Richard McCluskey and Martin Smith gave statements of a man carrying a child. McCluskey's statement was taken four days after his sighting. Smith's was reported 13 days after his sighting. They both gave a voluntary second statement in mid-September which implicated Jerry McCann and they both made these new statements because of the way Jerry McCann was carrying his child on his left shoulder off the plane. We are surely entitled to ask, was someone feeding them a script? I will mention here that I am aware that a significant number of people believe that Smithman was indeed Jerry McCann, and you are perhaps wondering why I am not making more of this possibility. Well, I don't rule that out. But bear in mind the Smith sighting is extremely similar to the very suspect Tanner sighting. I have also seen evidence which suggests to me that Madeline may have died on or around the 29th of April. If this is true, it is unlikely that Jerry McCann, four days later, would walk down a public street with his daughter's corpse for everyone to see. I hope to highlight this evidence in another film. Before I move on, I just want to deal with one report that surfaced in the Daily Mirror on the 16th of October 2013. Just two days after the BBC Crime Watch McCann special, which I am going to examine later on, it claimed that Martin Smith had tried to talk to the Portuguese police early on, but that they were not interested in his sighting. The report included several quotes from Martin Smith. Here are some extracts from the Mirror's report. A key witness in the Madeleine McCann case claimed yesterday that Portuguese police failed to take his evidence seriously. Mr Smith, a former Unilever executive, made a statement along with his wife Mary, daughter Eva, and son Peter soon after Madeline vanished on the 3rd of May 2007. Retired businessman Martin Smith, 64, provided details for an efit of the prime suspect after spotting the mystery man carrying a child at 10pm, close to where the three-year-old vanished more than six years ago but he said his information was virtually ignored by local officers because they were too busy chasing up another sighting of a man near Kate and Jerry McCann's holiday apartment in Praia de Luz 45 minutes earlier. Scotland Yard detectives reinvestigating the case after six years have now established that the suspect Portuguese police were so keen to trace, spotted by holidaymaker Jane Tanner at 9.20pm, was just an innocent British tourist returning with his own child from a creche. 
This article is misleading by suggesting that the Portuguese police took details from the Smiths for an e-fit, yet went on to ignore this. It was also misleading in suggesting that the police were too busy chasing up the sighting of another man, namely Tanaman. In fact, the Portuguese police were suspicious of Tanner's claimed sighting from day one, which is why they waited over three weeks before even publicising it to the public. And even then, they did so only after the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, leaned heavily on the Portuguese authorities to do so. Besides that, we know from Dr Amaral's book that as soon as the Smiths did get around to mentioning their sighting, the Portuguese police reacted swiftly and invited them over to take their statements. The Mirror report is in many respects false. Like many other mainstream media reports in this case, this false claim was probably, like so many other Madeleine McCann stories, supplied by the McCann's public relations spokesman, Clarence Mitchell. I want to go back just for a moment to look at a very curious development in the case just after Robert Murat was made a suspect. He was made a suspect on Tuesday the 15th of May. Within 24 hours of Murat being named as the chief suspect, three separate members of the McCann's group of friends, the Tapas Seven, Rachel Oldfield, Russell O'Brien and Fiona Payne, all made separate statements to the Portuguese police claiming they had seen Robert Murat in the vicinity of the Ocean Club around the time Madeline disappeared. They even stuck to their story when all three of them were summoned to a tense head-to-head -head confrontation with Murat in a pokey room in Portimao Police Station on the 11th of July that year. Taken together with a fourth Tapa 7 member, Jane Tanner, having also claimed to be sure that it was Robert Murat she'd seen carrying a child away from the McCann's apartment on the 3rd of May. Was this an organised effort by the McCann team to fit up Murat as the abductor of Madeleine McCann? Was he perhaps the fall guy, the patsy? These are issues I hope to cover in depth in a forthcoming look at the role of Robert Murat in this case. I'm going to conclude my analysis of Smithman with a look at how the McCann team came to bring great significance to the Irish family sighting, as we'll see from quite early on. And then I'll finish off with an in-depth look at how the BBC Crime Watch team back in October 2013 suddenly rescued this sighting from complete obscurity and helped DCI Andy Redwood to make Smithman Scotland Yard's number one suspect. It is an extraordinary story. So far, the Smithman sighting has gone through what I might call three phases. Phase one, from the 3rd to the 15th of May 2007, an unreported sighting. The Smiths claimed to have seen a man carrying a child, but did not report it. Phase 2, from the 16th of May to the 20th of September 2007. A reported sighting. The Smiths report what they say they saw, and the Portuguese police interview three members of the Smith family. Phase 3, from the 20th of September to December 2007. Could it be Jerry McCann? Martin Smith triggers new interest in the sighting by claiming that he was 60 to 80% sure he really saw Jerry McCann that night in early May. I'm now going to look at what I'm calling Phase 4, January 2008 to November 2008. The McCanns take over the Smith sighting. To see how Phase 4 developed and how the McCanns and their team got involved, we need to go back and look at the press coverage in the first week of January 2008. The news of the McCann team's involvement with the Smith Man sighting was first broken by Rupert Murdoch's son and the Daily Mail and Mirror on the 3rd of January 2008. The Sun report told us, Private detectives hunting the Madeleine McCann case are to quiz an Irish family who may have been the last to see her alive. Martin Smith, his wife and children told cops they saw a man carrying a little blonde girl in Pride de Luz on the night Maddie vanished. Investigators from the Matodo 3 agency, hired by Maddie's parents, Jerry and Kate, are preparing to travel to Ireland to interview them. Mr Smith, who has already spoken to Portuguese cops over the sighting, said yesterday, I'd talk to anyone to move this investigation on. I think about Maddie every day, he added. I found the Portuguese cops not to be the most efficient bunch. The Mirror report added this detail. The McCann spokesman said yesterday, our detectives are being very methodical and I am quite sure that this family will be on their list. 
We learned from that article that the investigators were from Matodo 3. In my earlier film, Buried by Mainstream Media, I showed what a disreputable agency Matodo 3 were. I also explained that the entire McCann private investigation team was run by Cheshire businessman Brian Kennedy. Mark Hollingsworth, who writes for the Evening Standard, wrote about the McCann's private investigations and is alleged to have said that key witnesses were questioned far too aggressively by Kennedy's investigators, so much so that some of them later refused to talk to police. The claim in the Mirror report that the Matodo three men were being very methodical was laughable. This was the outfit whose boss, Francisco Marco, had lied by boasting that Madeline was alive and that his men knew where she was and were closing in on the kidnappers and finally promised that Maddie would be home by Christmas. By the end of the month, Brian Kennedy had indeed made contact with the Smiths because of a letter sent on the 30th of January by Detective Sergeant Liam Hogan of the Garda Detective Branch in Drogheda to the Portuguese police. Hogan wrote, he has been contacted by numerous tabloid press looking for stories. He has been contacted by Mr. Brian Kennedy, who was supporting the McCann family, to take part in a photo fit exercise. He added, I do not believe that Martin Smith is courting the press. In my view, he is a genuine person. He is known locally and is a very decent person. What happened next in this story is shrouded in mystery. Martin Smith, to our knowledge, has said nothing publicly about it. The McCann team have said almost nothing. Most of what we know comes from a former top MI5 man. What we can distill from what little we know is the following. In April 2008, a company called Oakley International, headed by fraudster Kevin Halligan, took over most of the McCann team investigation from Matodo 3. After working for the McCanns for barely four months and pocketing nearly £600,000 for his work for the team, Halligan went on the run from the police until October 2009 when he was finally run to ground in a £700 a night Oxfordshire hotel and taken to Belmarsh Top Security Prison to await extradition to the US on a $2 million fraud charge. He was found guilty and served over four years in prison. Halligan employed as his right-hand man a man from Bury, Lancashire, called Henry Exton. Exton was the former head of MI5's covert intelligence unit, but fell from grace when he got a criminal record for stealing a bottle of perfume from Manchester Airport. The Sunday Times recently told us that Henry Exton, sometime during 2008, maybe together with others, visited the Smiths. We don't know where or when this mysterious meeting took place, but Doing the best we can, we can place the visit at some time between April and October 2008, most probably in the spring. What we also know on the record from him and the McCanns is that during this period he produced two e-fits. These were the ones shown on BBC Crime Watch in October 2013 and were then described as the central focus of the Scotland Yard investigation. Henry Exton, the McCanns, and now Scotland Yard are all united behind the claim that the Smith family produced these two efits. I am sceptical of this, and in a moment I will explain why. But first, let's move to what I am calling Phase 5 of the Smith sighting. January to May 2009, Smithman features in a pro-McCann documentary. Shortly after Kevin Halligan and his team were sacked in disgrace by the McCann team, Brian Kennedy appointed local man and former detective inspector Dave Edgar to lead the investigation. This was around November 2008. Some weeks later, another retired police officer, former Detective Sergeant Arthur Cowley, who lived in a cottage high up on Halgan Mountain, Wales, was appointed to join him. Ostensibly, these two men were appointed to look for Madeline. But in reality, it seems that they spent much of their time preparing for a very significant documentary on the Madeleine McCann case, produced by Menton Media in association with Channel 4. It was this documentary that the McCanns used to promote their suggestion that Jane Tanner's Tanner Man and the Smith family's Smith Man might be the very same person. How likely was it that a man seen with an abducted child by Jane Tanner at 9.15pm could be seen 45 minutes later, less than half a mile away, still carrying the abducted child. 
not only were Tannerman and Smithman linked in the documentary, there were two separate discussions in the film about this possibility. During the documentary, three other sightings of suspicious-looking men were also discussed, as well as Tannerman and Smithman. The most likely sighting of Madeleine and her abductor was by Jane Tanner, a friend of the McCanns. In the files, Kate believes another witness statement from an Irish family describes a very similar sighting to Jane's, less than a mile from the McCann's apartment. The reason why this is significant is both sightings were given independently. So when this family gave their statement, they weren't aware of Jane's description. And there's actually quite a lot of similarities and it does beg the question, I mean, how many people carry the children on a cold night not covered, you know, nothing on their arms or the feet, no blanket? Now, either there's been two people carrying children in that way who haven't come forward to eliminate themselves, or potentially they're related. But you think that child is Madeline? I think there's a good chance it could be Madeline. Certainly the, the description there sounds to me like Madeline. Kate and the Fine Madeline campaign coordinator travel to the search team's offices. They want to discuss the details of the upcoming reconstructions and three potentially key witness statements that all tell of a man hanging round the McCann's apartment in the days leading up to May the 3rd, 2007. Apart from the obvious of Jane, is side number th three, the, the man in the uh, alouette at the back of the apartment. So if, if number three de is definitely a very important side because it links them. The investigators have examined the statements from the three different witnesses and are now convinced that prior to Madeline's abduction, the McCanns were being watched. Okay. The, the team hope this new information will give them the breakthrough they need. You'd think it's got to be the same person, wouldn't you, really? Yeah. And all three say that he, he was watching the apartment. Yeah. We're here to discuss the, the pending reconstruction that we want done. So, basically, it looks like we've got five sightings, really. Two, a man with a child, and three, yeah. just a suspicious individual. Yeah. At the beginning of this discussion, Kate McCann introduces a very important idea. She says both sightings were given independently. But what did Gonchalo Amaral say in his book? The Smiths learn that, according to Jane Tanner's statements, Murat is definitely the man encountered on the night of the abduction. Mr Smith then gets in touch with the Irish police to relate what he saw on the night of May the 3rd. Were they working from the same script? Let's now look at the second time Smithman comes up in this documentary. It is possible that Jane Tanner is not the only person who saw Madeline being carried away by the abductor. Forty minutes after Jane's sighting, and half a mile away from the McCann's apartment, a family also saw a man carrying a young girl away from the town. Later, the witness thought that this might have been Jerry McCann, but this was investigated and ruled out by the Portuguese police. A man was seen here carrying a child just before 10 p.m. on the night Madeline was abducted. When the man saw the family, he appeared furtive and veered off to one side and, and carried on walking. But obviously, anyone carrying a child at night, it's, it's really important. We need to find out who this person was. I was with my family, we'd been out for the night and we were walking up this street when I saw a man and he was carrying a child. I thought they were father and daughter, so I wasn't so suspicious. The girl was about four, she looked like my granddaughter, blonde hair, pale white skin, typically British. The man didn't look like a tourist, I can't explain why, it was probably from his clothes. Someone knows the information and someone knows who took Madeline and someone knows where she is. Let's get moving. Let's get the phone ringing. 
The first thing to note about this statement is Dave Edgar's spin on what the Smith family say about their sightings. He says, the man appeared furtive and veered off to one side. To our knowledge, the Smiths in their statements do not say he appeared furtive, nor veered off to one side. He appears to have misled the viewers. Secondly, the family witness statement that is read out by the narrator is not a direct reading from Martin Smith's statement. It is selective and edited. Third, despite Martin Smith's statement back in September 2007 to claim that Jerry McCann was probably the man he'd seen on that dark night in May, this is now curtly dismissed by the narrator, who says the witness thought that this might have been Jerry McCann, but this was investigated and ruled out by the Portuguese police. The efits said to have been created by the Smiths during 2008 were not shown in this documentary. Why not? If the McCann team believed that these efits were drawn up by the Smiths, as they had apparently been told by ex-MI5 investigator Henry Exton, why were they not shown to all the viewers back in May 2009? That's not an easy question to answer, but let's try, with the help of a curiously worded apology published by the Sunday Times in December 2013. What was this apology, and how did it come about? The BBC Crime Watch programme, which we'll examine shortly, went out on the 14th of October 2013. The EFITs, apparently produced by Henry Exton, were the highlight of the entire broadcast. Exton, it seems, was incensed and complained to the Sunday Times. Here's part of the original Sunday Times article, published on the 27th of October, less than two weeks after the Crime Watch McCann special. Madeline Clues hidden for five years. The new prime suspect was first singled out by detectives in 2008. Their findings were suppressed. The critical new evidence at the centre of Scotland Yard's search for Madeleine McCann was kept secret for five years after it was presented to her parents by ex-MI5 investigators. The evidence was in fact taken from an intelligence report produced for Jerry and Kate McCann by a firm of former spies in 2008. It contained crucial efits of a man seen carrying a child on the night of Madeline's disappearance, which have only this month become public after he was identified as the prime suspect by Scotland Yard. A team of hand-picked former MI5 agents had been hired by the McCanns to chase a much-needed breakthrough in the search for their missing daughter Madeline. A report produced by the investigators was deemed hypercritical of the McCanns and their friends, and the authors were threatened with legal action if it was made public. Its contents remained secret until Scotland Yard detectives conducting a fresh review of the case contacted the authors and asked for a copy. They found that it contained new evidence about a key suspect seen carrying a child away from the McCanns' holiday apartment on the night Madeline disappeared. This sighting is now considered the main lead in the investigation. Efits taken from the report were the centrepiece of a Crime Watch appeal that attracted more than 2,400 calls from the public this month. One of the investigators, Henry Exton, whose work was sidelined, said last week he was utterly stunned when he watched the programme and saw the evidence his team had passed to the McCanns five years ago presented as a breakthrough. Exton said they had focused on the Smith sighting, travelling to Ireland to interview the family and producing efits of the man they saw. Their report said the Smiths were helpful and sincere and concluded the Smith sighting as credible evidence of a sighting of Maddie. Their report was delivered to the McCanns in November 2008. This report by the Sunday Times Insight team was very clear. Exton was saying that the Smiths were credible people. They helped him to draw up two efits. The McCanns knew about these efits before November 2008 and were handed a report about the efits in November 2008. Yet, said the Sunday Times, the McCanns had done nothing about it for a whole five years. It was a serious accusation, much too serious for the McCanns to ignore. They sued the Sunday Times for what they said was a gross libel of them. 
This led to a small and very curiously worded apology printed some weeks later by the Sunday Times. Let's now look at exactly what it said. In articles dated October 27, Madeline Clues Hidden for Five Years and Investigators Had EFITs Five Years Ago, we referred to EFITs which were included in a report prepared by private investigators for the McCanns and the Fund in 2008. We accept that the articles may have been understood to suggest that the McCanns had withheld information from the authorities. This was not the case. We now understand and accept that the AFITs had been provided to the Portuguese and Leicestershire police by October 2009. This apology was not enough for the McCanns. They carried on with their libel action, eventually forcing the Sunday Times to pay them £55,000 damages, plus of course their legal costs. The one factual statement we are interested in is this. The McCanns claim that they provided these EFITs to the Portuguese and Leicestershire Police by October 2009. Exton, as quoted in the Sunday Times, said he handed the report to the McCanns in November 2008. No doubt he would have told them about the EFITs as soon as he had produced them much earlier in the year. After all, the McCanns were paying him and the serial fraudster Kevin Halligan for his work. The McCanns say they provided the EFITs to the Portuguese police. Why have they not given us the actual date they did this? The same applies to their claim to have handed these EFITs to Leicestershire police. On what date did they do this? It seems they haven't told us. Also, the Times uses the curious phrase that they sent these EFITs by October 2009. This could mean anything. It could mean that they sent them a year earlier or it could mean that they waited until the last day of October 2009 to do so. Why do we not get a clear, open answer from them? What we can draw from this is that the McCanns may, indeed, have sat on these EFITs, that is, withheld them from the police for about 18 months. The EFITs were probably produced in around April 2008, but only by October 2009, 18 months later, it seems, had they provided these EFITs to the two police forces. Why did they delay passing this apparently vital information to the police at all? So what happened to the two EFITs after they handed them into the police? If they were handed to the Portuguese police and Leicestershire police as claimed, neither police force deemed them worthy of consideration. They did nothing, and neither did the McCanns. The next thing we know about the EFITs is the McCanns claim that the EFITs were passed to Operation Grange, the Scotland Yard team reviewing the Madeleine McCann case shortly after it was set up in May 2011. My next task is to explain why the head of Operation Grange, Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood, also did nothing with these EFITs until they were presented to an audience of some 7 million people on the BBC Crime Watch McCann special some two and a half years later. Why a further delay of two and a half years? I will explain this in a moment, but first let's get back to our general theme of how the McCanns have made use of the Smith sighting. So far I have identified five phases of the Smith man sighting. Here they are again. Now to phases six and seven. Phase six of the Smith sighting ran from June 2009 to April 2011. This is the period during which the McCanns actively promoted the Smith sighting on their Find Madeline website. Then, when Dr. Kate McCann published her book Madeline on the 11th of May 2011, Phase 7 began, the further promotion of Smith Man sighting on seven pages of her book. Let's now briefly examine these two phases. The sighting by an Irish family was uploaded to the McCann's Find Madeline website immediately after the 2009 Channel 4 documentary. An Irish voice was heard explaining the sighting with the following words. I was with my family. We'd been out for the night. After leaving a bar, we took the back way up some steps. We turned off this street and up another street. I'm not sure of its name. We were walking up this street when I saw a man and he was carrying a child. I thought they were father and daughter, so I wasn't so suspicious. He was walking down the street in the opposite direction to us. The girl was about four. She looked like my granddaughter. Blonde hair, pale white skin, typically British. The man didn't look like a tourist. I can't explain why. It was probably from his clothes. 
I only really saw the man when we passed each other. He was white, about 175 or 1.8 metres tall, perhaps 34 or 35 years old. He was slim to normal build, with short brown hair. He didn't wear glasses, moustache or a beard. I can't recall what he was wearing, apart from a pair of beige trousers. The girl was wearing light-coloured pyjamas. She was uncovered, no blanket or throw. Some of my family remember her having bare feet. He was carrying the girl over his arms, with her head against his left shoulder. He looked a bit uncomfortable in the way he carried her. This followed the wording of Martin Smith's initial statement very closely, except for one curious thing. In his witness statement, he had said that the man was about 35 to 40 years old. Now this statement says he was perhaps 34 or 35 years old. Why is the age more precise? This new estimate of the man's age as 34 to 35 also appears in Kate McCann's book two years later. We can see here that Martin Smith's original statement has been adapted, maybe to make it appear more credible. We wonder how much did Martin Smith actively cooperate in the making of this Channel 4 documentary and his message being put on the McCann's website. He was and is a potential witness in this case. He must presumably have been asked for permission to place his sighting on the McCann's website. Was he asked to allow the documentary makers to change his statement about the man's age from 35 to 40 to 34 to 35? If so, when did Martin Smith agree to this? Why was the statement changed and who made the decision to change it? These are important questions which remain unanswered. What would happen if he was put in the witness box and a barrister put this to him? Mr. Smith, you told the police the man you saw was 35 to 40 years old. Why and when did you change your mind about this? So we've had a look at phase six. Now what about phase seven? The further promotion of the Smith man sighting on seven pages of Kate McCann's book. If we look through Kate McCann's book, we see several clear references to Smith man. Page 98. We subsequently learned that less than 50 minutes after Jane's sighting, when I still had to discover that Madeline was missing, a family of nine from Ireland had also seen a man carrying a child, this time on Rua de Escola Primaria, a few minutes' walk from apartment 5A, heading towards Rua 25 de Abril. Their description was remarkably similar to Jane's. The man was in his mid-thirties, 1.75 to 1.8 metres tall, and of slim to normal build. These witnesses, too, said this person didn't look like a tourist. They felt it might have been because of what he was wearing. They also mentioned cream or beige trousers. The child, a little girl about four, with medium blonde hair, lying with her head towards the man's left shoulder. She was wearing light-coloured pyjamas, had nothing on her feet, and there was no blanket over her. The man did not look comfortable carrying the child, as if he wasn't used to it. In this short paragraph, Kate calls the two descriptions remarkably similar, and mentions as many as eleven distinct similarities. It is clear that Kate is suggesting that Smith Man was a genuine sighting, and probably the same man seen by Jane Tanner. Again on pages 328 and 329, Smith Man is referred to, and Kate now suggests it is the same man. Quote, who knows why there was a 45-minute gap between the two sightings, or where this man might have been in between? I have long ago stopped trying to come up with answers, because I don't think I need to. If the child was Madeline, and in four years no father has ever come forward to say it was him and his daughter, why would we assume that he was behaving normally or logically? There is nothing normal about stealing a little girl from her bed, so why should his subsequent actions be predictable? She goes on to speculate. The abductor would hardly have been expecting to see Jane walking towards him as he escaped, let alone have anticipated that Jerry would be standing talking around the corner. Whatever plan was in his mind, he might very well have been forced by these near misses to change it pretty quickly. Then finally, on pages 370 to 372, we get a direct comparison from Kate between Jane Tanner's Tannerman and Martin Smith's Smithman. Kate McCann is right to say that the similarities are striking. The only description that differs significantly is in the colour and the length of the man's hair. There is one curious statement she makes in her book, though, page 371. She says that Jane saw a man 5 foot 10 in height, 1.78 metres, making the man the same height as Smith man. 
but if you look at Tanner's statement, it indicates that the man was only 1.7 metres tall, which would make him only 5 foot 7. Why the change of about 3 inches? Kate says in her book, the man's height was recorded incorrectly in her, meaning Jane Tanner's statement. How does she know this? So we have seen in phases 6 and 7 how the McCanns made significance of the Smith man sighting. People bought her book and read about Smith Man. People kept visiting the McCann's website and heard the Irish family's account of the sighting. But now we move on to the most vital new phase in the development of the Smith sighting. Phase 8, Operation Grange gets the Smith Man e-fits and spends over six months planning a BBC programme to promote them. We know, as it's been admitted by the McCanns and Operation Grange, that very early on in the history of Operation Grange, the McCanns handed the EFITs to the senior investigating officer, DCI Andy Redwood. Operation Grange, based at Belgravia Police Station, was set up in May 2011, when Prime Minister David Cameron was pressurised by Rebecca Brooks, the chief executive officer of Rupert Murdoch's News International Empire, to set it up. We can assume that DCI Redwood had these two EFITs by the summer of 2011. One news report said it was August 2011. They were finally shown to the British public on a BBC Crime Watch show on the 14th of October 2013. Over two years later, why the delay? I suggest two reasons. First, DCI Redwood couldn't use the Smithman EFITs until he had solved the problems created by the sighting by Jane Tanner. There were two main problems with it. It was not credible. There were numerous indications that it was fabricated. And, as we've just seen, how could you possibly explain a man walking around a small town for 45 minutes with a child you've just abducted? You couldn't. The second reason for the delay could be that he may have needed to have Martin Smith's cooperation with any broadcast about him on Crime Watch especially as the Crime Watch McCann special was to be the most hyped Crime Watch show ever. We know on the record that DCI Redwood had two interviews with Martin Smith, one in 2012 and one in 2013, as the Crime Watch program was being planned. We don't know if these meetings took place by DCI Redwood going to Ireland or Martin Smith flying to London. We don't know if any other members of the Smith family were present at these two meetings, what we can be almost sure about is that DCI Redwood would have discussed with Martin Smith the two efits he now had in his possession, and one would assume Redwood would have shared with Martin Smith exactly what he was going to say about the Smith sighting on the Crime Watch programme. Strangely, although DCI Redwood made a huge deal of the efits and made reference to the sighting by an Irish family, he did not actually say on Crime Watch that the Smiths produced the efits. I'll come to that in a moment. Back in July 2008, when Dr. Amaral published his book, The Truth of the Lie, he was persuaded that the Smiths had honestly described their sighting. He also tended to believe Martin Smith when he claimed to have recognised Jerry McCann as possibly the man he'd seen carrying a child on the 3rd of May. But now we've seen how the McCann team became involved, and how by the first few months of 2009 they were already making use of the sighting. Then in 2011, in her book, we saw how in a number of sections of her book, Madeline, she openly suggested that the men Jane Tanner and Martin Smith said they saw were one and the same. Smithman was being actively used by the McCann team. Conchalo Amaral had believed that Smithman might well be Jerry McCann, but now the McCanns were strongly suggesting he was the abductor. And now we move on to consider the last phase of Smithman. Phase 9, October 2013, Smithman revealed by Scotland Yard as the chief suspect. Let's now look at the relevant part of the transcript of the BBC Crime Watch McCann special on the 14th of October 2013. Madeline and her siblings, Sean and Emily, were staying in the front bedroom which looked out onto the front car park. Um, 
Madeline was in a bed and the two children were in travel cots um, between, between Madeline's bed and the bed that was nearest to the window. The careful and critical analysis of the timeline has been absolutely key. Primarily, we're focused on the area between 8.30 and 10. We know that at 8.30, that was the time that Mr. and Mrs. McCann went down to the tapas area for their dinner, and we know that at around 10 p.m., that was when Mrs. McCann found that Madeline was missing. One of the most pivotal events on the timeline was Jane Tanner's sighting of a man carrying a child. He was walking in this spot, just metres from where Madeline had been sleeping. This man was widely thought to be Madeline's abductor, but the team was taking nothing for granted. One of the things that we picked up very quickly was the fact that there was a night crash that was operating from the main Ocean Club reception and eight families had left 11 children in there and one particular family we spoke to gave us information that was really interesting and exciting. In fact, I would say it was, a, it was a revelation moment when having discussed with them what they were doing on the night, they themselves believed that they could be the Tanner sighting. The British father had collected his two-year-old daughter from the crash. He had been walking near the McCann's apartment. This is the actual photograph taken by Metropolitan Police officers of the man dressed in the kind of clothes he wore on holiday. This image was compared to the artist's impression. It is uncannily similar. And we know the pajamas that their child was wearing, that it is, again, uncannily striking, the similarity. So what you're saying is that the timeline that everyone was working on for years in this case was wrong. We're almost certain now that this sighting is not the abductor. But very importantly, what it says is that from 9.15, we're able to allow the clock to continue to move forward. And in doing so, things that have not been quite as significant or received quite the same degree of attention are now the center of our focus. This was an enormous discovery for the team an innocent explanation for the suspect who'd been at the center of the case for six years. Their attention quickly turned to another sighting, which could now be the key to the entire mystery. It was here at 10 p.m. that an Irish family witnessed another man carrying a child. They saw him come down the hill from the direction of the Ocean Club, heading that way towards the beach. Could this have been Madeline and her abductor? So, Redwood had effectively claimed to the British nation that he had traced, identified and eliminated the chief suspect, Tanner Mann. He was almost certain, he told Crime Watch viewers. What now? Then, as we saw, Redwood came up with another bombshell. His chief suspect was now Smith Mann, the man the Irish family said they had seen and he produced two efits of the suspect. Here they are. But when Crime Watch showed us these two efits, Redwood appears to have been guilty of some cunning sleight of hand. Let's just listen carefully to the actual words used on Crime Watch. It was here at 10 p.m. that an Irish family witnessed another man carrying a child. They saw him come down the hill from the direction of the Ocean Club, heading that way towards the beach. Could this have been Madeline and her abductor? He was a white man with brown hair, and the child that he had in his arms was described as being about three to four years of age with blonde hair, possibly wearing pyjamas. A description very close to that of Madeleine McCann. Two of the witnesses helped create efits of the man they saw. Today, for the first time, we can reveal the true significance of these images. This could be the man that took Madeline, but very importantly, there could be an innocent explanation. The efits are clear. Notice that presenter Amrila Walla does not actually say that these two efit images were produced by the Smith family. He refers, for some reason, only to the two witnesses. Then he says that the two efits of the man are clear. 
but most people who have looked at these two images suggest that they look to be images of two entirely different people. Moreover, computer experts have analysed the two images and consider that the two images have been produced on different EFIT computer programmes. One image is grainy, the other is sharper. If they were, as claimed, drawn up by two members of the Smith family, why do they look like they were generated using different software? But still more relevant, why, if we are looking for just one man, do we get two images which, to most people, look like quite different blokes? The man on the left, when compared to the man on the right, has a fat face, has a rectangular shaped face, the man on the right has a triangular shaped face, his curly hair brushed back, unlike the crew cut of the man on the right, he has thicker lips, has a shortish, flattish nose compared with the long, thin nose of the man on the right. It is highly unusual for the police to show two different efforts of one man they are really looking for. It's even more unusual for a pair of efforts to reveal so many different features. Why did the police not get the Smiths to come up with one composite efit of the man they said they desperately wanted to trace? But on top of that is the question of how an efit could have been constructed, bearing in mind the Smiths' initial statements. They only saw him for a few seconds, it was dark, the street lighting was weak, they all said that the child covered the man's face, so they couldn't see what he looked like. Each of them told the police explicitly that they would not be able to recognise the man if they saw him again. Here are the statements made by each of the Smiths about the man they said they saw. He did not wear glasses and had no beard or moustache. He did not notice any other relevant details, partly due to the fact that the lighting was not very good. He did not notice the body clothing and cannot describe the colour or fashion of the same. It is not possible for him to recognise the individual in person or by photograph. He does not remember if he wore glasses or had a beard or moustache. He did not notice any other relevant details as the lighting was bad. He also does not remember the clothing the individual wore or his shoes. He states that he did not notice those details. What we had seen was so vague that we couldn't identify the guy. At the time we saw his face but now cannot remember it. She thinks that he had a clean shaven face states that probably she would not be able to recognise either the individual or the child. Bearing in mind these statements, how could any efits realistically have been produced? In my email to Martin Smith on the 21st of January 2015, I wrote, Dear Martin, I am continuing to research the events surrounding the Madeleine McCann case and I would like to ask you if you would do an interview for a possible TV film. I am led to believe that the efits which were featured on Crime Watch UK in October 2013 were both derived from yours and or members of your family's descriptions of the man you saw. There is some confusion about these efits, not least the fact that they were never released until five years after they were produced. Would you be willing to be interviewed just to clear up what the sequence of events was after you had the sighting? If you are unable to do an interview, can you tell me in an email, one, who asked you to do the EFITs, two, which organisation drew the EFITs, three, when were the two EFITs done and were they done at the same time and place, four, which person in your family was the witness for each of the EFITs, five, did you expect the EFITs to be made public when you made them, six, did you think it strange that they were not made public? To date, I have had no response from Martin Smith. Now let's move on to consider the blurry image of the man allegedly found by DCI Andy Redwood, the man said to be carrying a child home from the creche, the man, so DCI Redwood told Crime Watch viewers, who was the man Jane Tanner really saw. The first point we might ask is, where had he been for the last six and a half years? He was allegedly in Prior de Luz at the time, he must have been fully aware of all the publicity about Madeline. He must have known that Jane Tanner had claimed to have seen a man carrying a child near apartment 5A at exactly 9.15pm. He probably saw, or was at least aware of, all the documentaries about Madeline, all the news items, the TV interviews by the McCanns on such programmes as Oprah Winfrey and Piers Morgan. To say the least, this raises a major question about the validity of DCI Redwood's claims about this unnamed man suddenly having come forward after six and a half years. 
Let's look back for a moment exactly what the Crime Watch programme told us about this man who'd suddenly contacted DCI Redwood. One particular family we spoke to gave us information that they themselves believed that they could be the Tanner sighting. The British father had collected his two-year-old daughter from the crash. He had been walking near the McCann's apartment. Crime Watch also told us that in the blurred photograph of him, the man was dressed in the kind of clothes he wore on holiday. Not only that, but we were told that his two-year-old daughter was wearing pyjamas that were uncannily, strikingly similar. The coincidences are simply amazing. But let's also consider this. DCI Redwood speaks of a family being on holiday. It's reasonable to assume that the man's wife or partner, the child's mother, was with him on holiday. Where was she when this man was allegedly carrying this toddler back to his holiday apartment? Why did he not have a buggy or a pushchair? Why did he not have a coat, blanket or warm outer clothing for the child? We are simply being asked to take on trust from Scotland Yard that this man who comes forward after six and a half years really exists. Do you believe him? There is surely room for doubt, and that doubt was shared publicly by one of the most respected workers with children, child psychologist and former state prosecutor Wendy Murphy, a lady who had studied the Madeleine McCann case in depth. Here she is on Fox News giving her opinion on Scotland Yard's attempts to find yet another mystery abductor in the case. Help solve the mystery of what happened to Madeleine McCann. She, of course, is the three-year-old British girl who disappeared while on vacation more than six years ago. Now Scotland Yard is planning to release a new computerized sketch that shows a possible suspect. Wendy Murphy is a former prosecutor and a child advocate. She joins us now. Hi, Wendy. Good to be with you. Finally, finally, six years later, investigators are releasing a computerized sketch of who they call basically a person of interest, a suspect that people saw around the vacation condo that night. What took them so long? Uh, I hope you don't mind if I duck that question because I'm not buying it. I mean, I think this is more PR than anything. There's, in my opinion, no new suspect, and there will never be a new suspect unless and until the parents answer questions. Remember, Kate McCann, poor Madeline's mom, refused to answer 48 questions now, and Wendy, hired a when team of lawyers right away. Uh, but this is important. She refused right away to answer. Uh, she, she hired lawyers right away, refused to answer 48 questions. Things like, what did you see when you walked into the room where your child was supposed to be sleeping? I mean, I am so not interested in being dragged down a rabbit hole about fake suspects. Now, and I think this is all related to a civil suit now underway in Portugal. The McCann sued the former police chief for defamation. Because he wrote and now this Kate book, wants this, this alleged tell-all book. Yes. Wendy, hold on. Let me tell you the other side of this. Because there's a lot of evidence on the side of the parents being completely innocent as well. They say that the Portuguese police never took the case seriously. They never did the kind of investigation that we certainly would have done here in the United States, which is talking to other people at the vacation, uh, at the, where, where they were vacationing in Portugal. Furthermore, Kate and Jerry, the parents, have appealed to their country's prime minister, David Cameron, for help on this investigation. Is that something you do if you're trying to stay under the radar and you feel guilty? Do you hire the nation's biggest defense attorneys, PR firms, and refused to answer questions. The Portuguese police did a very good job, and the PR misinformation, especially in this country, is doing a disservice to this poor little girl who is dead, I believe, and has no voice. The libel suit currently underway in Portugal is important because the McCanns sued that ex-police chief, claiming he lied about them in his book. Now Kate McCann wants to testify in writing because she doesn't want to submit to cross-examination. I think this is all related to that, and this all we have a new suspect thing is part of them again trying to distract attention from the fact that as parents of a missing, probably dead child, what are you doing not answering questions? Creshman served Scotland Yard's purposes. They had got rid of the embarrassing sighting by Jane Tanner, widely regarded as fabricated. Now they had got that out of the way, they could change the window of time during which the alleged abduction happened from five minutes to more like 50 minutes. And they had a brand new abductor, Smith Man. 
but in this film we've traced this series of four alleged abductors and found all four with inconsistencies. First we considered Sagres man. We showed that the claim by Nuno Lorenko that Krakowski on holiday from Poland for a week had tried to snatch his daughter lacked credibility. It seemed he couldn't recall on what date it was supposed to have happened and he didn't bother telling the police about it for days. We exposed the attempt to suggest that the McCanns were also in Sagres and that Krakowski had seen Madeleine there as no more than a media invention, completely unsubstantiated. Then we saw the evidence that Jane Tanner's statement may have been fabricated and seemingly based on the same description that Nuno Lorenko gave about Krakowski. Next we saw that the sighting of Smith, man by the Irish family, had numerous problems, not least why it took so long to report their sighting and the later enhancements to the sightings made by them or by others. Finally we have examined the unlikely crash man, which is a tale full of improbability and the most unlikely coincidences. Only one of these men has been proven to be real, and that is Sagres man the man described by Nuno Lorenko, and he was actually Wojciech Krakowski. Is it possible that Nuno Lorenko, primed by others, deliberately invented a tale about an attempted abduction of his daughter? Is it possible he told his unlikely tale to the Portuguese police on the morning after Jane Tanner described her sighting, in order to try to convince the police that there was an abductor? especially when one considers all the evidence in my previous film, there probably never was an abductor at all. It certainly seems that way. Was the description of Smithman another fabrication, and why was it almost identical to the descriptions of Sagresman and Tanaman? After all, apart from these four alleged abductors, what other evidence of an abduction do we actually have? To my knowledge, there is none. In my previous film, we looked at some of the many contradictions and changes of story surrounding these claims. Apart from what the McCanns themselves say, what actual independent forensic evidence do we have of an abductor? Is there any forensic evidence, footprints, fingerprints, hairs, clothing fibres, DNA, anything in fact? It seems there is none. The only complete fingerprint found on the window was actually that of Kate McCann suggesting that she may have been the last person to handle the window, sometime shortly before the police were called. Did anyone hear this mystery abductor, maybe lifting the shutters, entering or fleeing the building, the noise of a child, anything at all in fact? Again, absolutely nothing. I'm going to wrap up this film by stating that this video and my previous videos on this case have been made with almost zero funding. I would argue that I have exposed much of the disinformation and got closer to the truth about what really happened. I want you to compare my videos with the information you have seen put out by mainstream media, who have got almost limitless resources. Looking at what I have managed to uncover and put forward in these films as a one-man operation, it should have been fairly straightforward for mainstream media to do the same. It should have been easy for them to carry out investigative journalism and do a similar job to me. But I hope I have fully demonstrated that this is not what mainstream media are about. In fact, I would argue they have helped mislead and therefore hide and bury the true story of Madeleine McCann. Exercises like the Leveson Inquiry are no more than psychological operations to try and show the media are being brought to book. Nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you for watching and please copy and distribute this film freely.